First of all, I just wanted to say uh, welcome. Um, we are, on behalf of the County Commission, uh, we're very grateful that you all agreed to serve on what I think is a very important board. Um, it may not be like other counties that have experienced um, a, a huge growth or un, uneven growth that we may not have, but it's still extremely important what we're doing here. And I, I just really wanted to say thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Eggers, and I'm the current chair of the County Commission. Um, and um, really just glad to be here tonight. Um, what we're, I think what we'll do for the most part um, is just kind of maybe take 30 seconds or so, a minute, just to say who you are and kind of what you're doing, where you're from, um, what you bring to, uh, to tonight or to this, to this group. Um, we, um, you, you have an agenda in front of you which you'll go through. Um, my parts will just be to kind of weave our way through this and then talk a little bit about chair and vice chair, um, which is not overly complicated, but just be thinking about, you know, kind of what experience you had individually running a meeting. It would help. To, to have done that before. Um, you can volunteer yourself. Um, you want to mention that when you're going around that, yeah, you've done that before. So when we get to that part, we have that dialogue and discussion. Um, so um, my, I've, I've been um, on the county commission about six years. Uh, this is my actually my seventh year, second term, um, and um, have just thoroughly enjoyed it. I moved to the area back in 1985, so I've been here it just seems like yesterday, but of course it's been you know 30 some years now, the longest I've ever been in one place. Love the county. My wife and I got in the car on Sunday and drove down the beaches and went over to St. Petersburg and then back up into North County. It was just, I mean, it didn't take that long. It was just a nice drive and it was a beautiful day and it's just a great county to live in. And I just, uh, the, so again, the parts that you all are playing tonight uh, are extremely important. Um, and, and so, um, I have a commercial real estate business also. Um, didn't do a darn deal last year during the craziness that was and had done a few deals this year, thankfully. Um, but um, all is good and uh, I've been, or whatever the wood is, COVID free so far. So um, anyway, we'll go ahead and then Mark, we'll start with the W's. Tell oh, us thanks, uh, Dave. Uh, Mark Weinkrantz, uh, former East Lake Fire Commissioner, chairman for three out of four years, uh, YMC North Pinellas Board for about 12 or 13 years, did chairman up there, and uh, currently sitting on the Dunedin Fine Arts Center Board and the Creative Pinellas Board. Um, retired airline pilot in the area since 1987. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for being here. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ron Schultz. Uh, I sell commercial real estate, so shopping centers and anywhere you spend retail dollars I sell. No competition with Dave. Um, sorry to hear about your last year. I had a great year last year. Dave. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I, if you don't mind, I want to look at this list I've got. So my, my mother-in-law had her birthday this past weekend. She said, how many boards are you on? And I went, I don't know, two, three? I was on five currently. Not that I don't mind, I could do this. Um, I give my, I always tell people, I told Dave this before, this is for business. And this is for my community. Been out here 20 years, came from Chicago. Love this area. Um, started giving back. My folks lived in Crescent Oaks. They needed a light in front of their house. They finally got it, as Mark knows. Um, but for 10 years, we pushed for that. We, we created Council of North County Neighborhoods. Uh, I was on that for eight years, I think. Um, started, anyway, if you don't mind, I'll run through this real quick and then I'll be done. Pinellas County Local Planning Agency, 2011 to present, past chairman. Palm Harbor Community Service Agency, present. Uh, from 2019 as a director. Camelot Community Care, $80 million not-for-profit in five states, headquartered in Clearwater, uh, helping at least 8,500 kids, families every year for foster care. Uh, been on it for 10 years. I've been the chairman for 10 years. Uh, president of Landsbrook Masters Association, past president, council of North County Neighborhoods, vice president, East Lake chairman, past chair of the board of the library, Pinellas County Metropolitan Planning Organization, leadership Pinellas class, 2010, for all Booker HOA, Pinellas County Sheriff's Program 2008, and Palm Harbor Community Services Agency to 2019 to present. Whew, I'm done. And Thank my you. wife still loves me of 28 years. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. You Appreciate have the floor. it. Thank you for all that service and Absolutely. thank you for being here. Truly enjoy it. Christian. Uh, so, my name is uh, Chris Rupel. I'm a uh, 
I don't have quite uh, the list to read off of. Uh, but uh, in any case, I'm a Florida native, was born at Meese um, Hospital in Dunedin and have been here working in my professional career since 1996. Uh, my wife and I settled uh, back here. I am the founder of and run a prepaid debit card business. We specialize in employer payroll card programs. Uh, it was acquired by a company called Green Dot Corporation based out of Pasadena, California in 19, or excuse me, in 2017. I still run the business that they acquired from me. Uh, otherwise, I've been active in the community. I went through the Leadership Pinellas in 2003 and was uh, president of Leadership Pinellas in, from 2008 to 2009. Um, yeah. I have three children in the area who attend school, and we live in uh, Bel Air, Florida. Yeah, very nice. Congratulations, and Chris, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. And for serving. Go ahead. Yes, I'm Dr. Karen Owen. I'm a retired geospatial scientist. I used to teach different forms of geography classes at the university level in Northern Virginia, and I've been a citizen resident of Pinellas County for about six years now. I've been a poll worker. Um, I serve on several volunteer boards, including the League of Women Voters, my church outreach committee chair. Um, and I'm here to share my expertise, which I think could be very useful. I actually love working with GIS data. Probably not many of you do, but I think that's a, <laughs> a lot of fun. And I'm here also to provide my uh, expertise to make sure that the process of redistricting in Pinellas is fair and transparent. Thank, Thank you. you, Karen, for that. And we were intrigued with your resume and your background and how it would apply here. So thank you for, for serving. Allison. Hi there, I'm Allison Knoll. I am a fundraiser at Eckerd College. I have the pleasure of working in the advancement office there for almost two years now, so it's very exciting to still be there during a pandemic. Um, I was born and raised in St. Petersburg and over in Seminole here, and uh, I do not have an extensive resume of service in the area, so think of this as me starting out. <laughs> but great. Thank you again for, for agreeing to serve, Allison. Thank you. Bruce. Thank you, Dave. Hey, like you, uh, located to the area in 1985. Uh, fell in love with Dunedin. My in-laws lived here forever. Uh, my father-in-law retired from the Air Force in 1970, so uh, brought us to the area. And, and during the working days, uh, my wife and I uh, owned and operated a dental equipment manufacturing company in Clearwater. And the response to that always is, Somebody has to do it. <laughs> so we sold the business in 2012, and uh, throughout my working career, I've always believed, just like everybody here in this room, of, of giving back. So I'm very proud to have served the citizens of Dunedin, like you have, Dave, as a, as a city commissioner and vice mayor, uh, kind of in service to nonprofits. Uh, primarily, a lot of it in the healthcare field. Yeah. Uh, a 20-year board member and two-time uh, past chair of the Clearwater Free Clinic. And, and we spun off an organization a few years ago called the Community Dental Clinic, which operates on the same business model of volunteer physicians and, and dentists, uh, providing uh, dental care to the uninsured. Um, currently, which has been a lot of fun during COVID, uh, I currently serve as chairman of the board of Meese Life, which is a senior living facility. Dave, you're a past chair as yeah, well. Beautiful place. Uh, COVID has been very tough on us. And uh, I just got back uh, this afternoon from a senior living conference in Orlando. And uh, it's uh, the industry has taken a, taken a big hit, but we're, yeah. we're coming back. Um, other than that, served on the Salvation Army uh, as a community advisory board. Um, and that's about it. And wow. I'm happy to be here. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great to see you all. And it'll yeah. be wonderful to serve with each and every one of you and, and ultimately serve the residents of uh, Pinellas yeah. County. So thank, thank you, you, Bruce. Thank you for all you've done. James. I'm uh, Jim Everett, actually. James is what my mom calls me when I'm in trouble. <laughs> when you were in trouble, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, uh, I live in Reddington Shores, um, University of South Florida Bulls graduate. Go Bulls. Um, <laughs> have been at the beaches since about 2005. Um, I have a, a wife and four children who are three of the four in the area, which we're very happy about. Uh, I have served, I currently serve on the Board of Heroes of St. Pete Police and Firefighters. We raise funds for fallen officers and fallen firefighters in the city of St. Petersburg. Um, I served on the Madeira Beach Planning Board when I, uh, when I lived in Madeira Beach and chaired that for five years and also served on the Civil Service Board for the city and currently serve on the board of the Treasure Island Madeira Beach Chamber of Commerce. So very happy to be here yeah. and 
hope to contribute to the process. Yeah. Congratulations, all thank that you. you've done, and thank you for being here, Jim. Esther. I am, uh -oh, I am humbled to sit in this room right now, OMG. So Esther Eugene, um, the two most important things, I think, before I go into the other things that are equally maybe so important, I have been the chair, mom of two young ladies, <laughs> um, vice chair, soon to be wife, as of September 22nd wow. of my family. Um, I am the president of the St. Petersburg branch NAACP, uh, vice chair of the Pinellas County Continuum of Care, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, um, member of the National Council of Negro Women, task force lead for um, Congressman Bill Arrakis um, for his Veteran Suicide Prevention Task Force, um, I sit currently on the St. Petersburg Community Advisory Council, and also I'm the member of the St. Petersburg CBA Policy Council. And I am again humbled to sit amongst this group of people. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, and thanks for all you've done, and thank you for agreeing to be on, on this board. Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, like Esther said, it's, uh, it's humbling to be here in this room. I know we're gonna do great work. I look forward to working with all of you. Uh, my name is Brian Angst. I've lived in uh, Clearwater since 1988. Um, I was honored to be the chairman of the Pinellas County Youth Advisory Committee about 21 years ago, so <laughs> in another lifetime. Uh, currently, I'm on the Juvenile Welfare Board, where I'm a past chairman, uh, the Judicial Nominating Commission, where I'm just stopped being the chairman, which my staff is very happy about, um, Ruth Eckert Hall, and the YMCA of the Suncoast. So I look forward to working with you, and. Um, I'm looking forward to a good process. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. My name is Mary Lou Ambrose. I'm a graduate of Rutgers University in both business and law. Um, moved to Pinellas County in 2005, no, yeah, 2005. And uh, my husband and I have a, owned a uh, insurance agency until the end of 2018. Uh, during my time here, I've been mostly involved in political things. Um, during that time, I've been a member of the Democratic Executive Committee where I was a secretary. I ran for District 66, and I am currently president of the Largo Mid Pinellas Democratic Club. In 2011, I attended a local redistricting meeting. I was upset because I felt, I felt there was unfair representation. Now, after fair districts amendment, I'm hoping that things will change somewhat. I understand from the information we received and from what you said earlier, in this county, the, uh, the population has changed very little. Um, but I also know that in Pinellas County and in the rest of Florida, um, elections are won by half a point. However, our representation is not balanced in Tallahassee. And I'm hoping that fair districts can become fair and that we will be able to help that along just a little bit by being part of this group. Thank you for being here, Mary Louise. Kurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Kurt Spitzer. I'm your consultant uh, for this uh, project. I, I must say this is a a stellar group that we have uh, here today, and I'm looking forward to working with you over the next few months. My background's uh, been in local government. I uh, was with the Florida Association of Counties for 10 years, and I've had my consulting firm for about 32 years now. We've uh, staffed the Pinellas County Charter Review Commission several times. We were the consultants for the redistricting effort when the county commission went from five at-large commissioners to a mix of three at-large and four single-member uh, districts. And we've worked with uh, local governments as big as Pinellas down to the city of Quincy in terms of redistricting efforts. Uh, I've been uh, married to my wife for 35 years. We just had our anniversary not too long ago. And most importantly, I uh, grew up in Rennington Shores. And uh, I can remember Gulf Boulevard when it was a dirt road. <laughs> It probably hasn't gotten much wider. I mean, so. <laughs> Kurt, thank you. Thank you for, for being here tonight as well. Wade. Thank you, Chairman. 
Good evening, board members. My name's Wade Vos. I'm gonna be your attorney throughout this process. Very happy to be here to work with you all. Uh, I'm the managing partner of the Vos Law Firm. Our main office is in Winter Park, actually, but we uh, serve local governments throughout the state of Florida. We're city, our firm is city attorney for nine cities and county attorney for one county throughout the state. And we also do a whole lot of specialized work for different local government, city and county, boards and so on everywhere throughout the state. Always love to get over here to Pinellas County to work with the fantastic people over here. I had the opportunity to serve as the general counsel for the 2015-2016 Charter Review Commission for Pinellas County. That happened to have been the Charter Review Commission that put the amendment on the ballot that created the county redistricting board that you all uh, now sit on. So look forward to working with you all. Thank you, Wade. Um, yeah, I just think we've got a great group here, obviously very into your our community, into your respective communities, and um, and I just think that's the most important thing. So thank you uh, for stepping up. Um, Vice Chair and Chair, I mean, clearly there are folks that have, you know, run meetings before and, um, and feel comfortable doing that. Um, we obviously have to have somebody chair and have somebody back back that person up if they can't be here. Um, I, I I don't think there's any really other criteria. I'm not saying you have to have experience doing it. I just think it makes it a little bit easier if, if you have. Kurt Wade, if you had, did you have any any thoughts on that before we uh, let them start uh, their deliberation? On uh, no, I think that that. Uh, is a good summary of, of okay. the qualifications. It would be helpful, but not not mandatory uh, that someone have prior experience. Okay, thank you. Um, I forgot Kevin over there. Kevin um, Kevin Newson is one of our assistant county administrators, um, and he um, you're going to be at all of these uh, all the meetings, right? Okay, so he he's, uh, works directly for our county administrator Barry Burton. Um, I'm not sure what all your departments are. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get to Brian in just a second. He's got uh, numerous departments, including economic development and CVB and the airport. Um, yeah, administrative. Service. So thank you um, for for taking this on as well. Brian Lowack is one of the a new assistant to the county administrator positions that I've been fighting for 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 six years, and um, we have three of them: one that works the Lailman area, and one that works North County, and then one that works um, kind of the rest of the unincorporated area, a Ridgecrest and um, some of the other unincorporated areas. He's done he's doing a great job. Um, all three of them are doing great jobs, and it really becomes a an important element in representing residents throughout the county. In, in these unincorporated areas. And he kind of cuts across all boundaries, all the different departments that are involved and, and makes things happen. So Brian, thanks for all that you do. Uh, appreciate your being here as well. Um, so uh, really uh, the last thing that I need to do is, is to, to just to be here and facilitate your ch choice of chairman and vice chairman. And so I just really open up the, uh, up, open up the floor for um, any thoughts that you all have or if anybody really would like to do that and you know oh, so you know this is always that awkward moment of step up if you would like and, and state your case and if anybody else would like to do that you can follow suit and then we'll just take a, a take a vote so I'm going to well I'll, I'll jump in certainly do want to cast my hat in um, for, okay. um, for the opportunity to be chair and or vice chair um, I think it's important um, when we look at these particular roles and when we look at the districts, um, we look at what's going on and then the viewpoint of the person that will, um, in essence, um, take the lead on some of the conversations, but not just take the lead on some of the conversations, but hear what's, saying, what's being said from others at the table as well. There is importance in the role, um, but, but, but in the importance also being able to um, operate from a place of um, non-partiality when listening to others. Okay. And so certainly, I um, definitely want to put my hat on the table. Okay, thank you, Esther. Mm -hmm. Anybody else giving some thought? Yes, Ron. Uh, I would be more than happy to facilitate any of our meetings um, either in person. I enjoy getting everyone to work together. 
hopefully anybody need me to repeat what I just said? Yeah. Hearing none. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, a lot of times I've been called in to facilitate working together as a broker. And you know this, um, that's what we do for a living. We put deals together and make things happen. This is different. This requires a bunch of thoughtful, intelligent, uh, well-versed, community-driven, give back, because it's very hard to find people like that in the community. We all know it. Uh, I always think if I don't do it, my neighbor doesn't do it, who's going to do it? Who's going to give back? Who's going to you know, work together? Um, I'd be more than happy in any way that I can help with the board having many years of chairmanship behind me, and I understand kind of the rules of the game and how to let everyone participate in, uh, in board membership. So thank you, Ron. That's it. Sure. Thank you, Ron. Hey, uh, just if I could, uh, the whole key here under redistricting is to uh, maintain credibility and to facilitate uh, so every voter's voice is heard in an equal level here. Um, I'll put my name in the hat, but more importantly, I think the outcome of this uh, should be probably one R and one D as chair and vice chair, just to keep a balance going. I'd hate to think anybody, regardless of what anybody else in here thinks, per, uh, their perception of people that might be watching this, we need to go ahead and maintain the highest level of uh, credibility. So that's my only input on that. Okay. Um, any any um, comments on that that I need to, to I, I need to worry about as far as asking people to state their parties and all that? I mean, it's uh, not that wasn't. You know, yeah, I, I I would suggest that that was an offer of a thought from, from one board okay. member. Uh, Got it. Okay. Certainly anybody can share that information, okay. not share it uh, as they I would want that's, to. That's fine. Thank you for you just let it kind of take its course. Yeah. Ask uh, Mary Louise, sorry. Yeah, um, I would throw my hat in simply because I'm really very interested in what's happening with redistricting and I've been interested in for a long time. My uh, running of meetings is kind of limited to uh, a, a meeting every month that I run for the uh, my club, and I also uh, have been on several boards in the in my town. But basically, I think it's my interest and my passion really for doing this right because I think fair districts is really important. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I I just want to offer uh, myself as either chair or vice chair. Uh, Brian Angst. I uh, have been very blessed with a lot of experience uh, facilitating meetings as the chair. I think the most important role of a chair is to be a facilitator. I uh, don't think the chair sets the tone. I think the chair uh, makes the conversation productive uh, and then gets to a consensus. And I have a lot of experience doing that on both the Juvenile Welfare Board, uh, which is a bipartisan group, uh, and also the Judicial Nominating Commission, which is also a bipartisan group. So if we get to a point where those skills are, are uh, ideal, I'd offer myself uh, for either chair or vice chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've, got five, I've, I've got five names and I'll, I'll remind you of those five names. I'm not, I'm not rushing anybody if anybody else wants to step forward. Um, and um, just, just to go back uh, again, I, I think I, I don't want to necessarily, I'm only the chair to establish the chair and the vice chair, and then I'm out of here. So um, I don't want to overstep my bounds here that one of your members uh, suggested the um, one of the chair or the vice chair being uh, different, different parties so that we don't have two Republicans or we don't have two Democrats. Um, that was just a suggestion. Um, not sure how this board feels about that. Um, I think we probably should, should get a, a sense of if that motion has legs, um, then then we need to take into account when we do the do the vote. Um, so um, and I and I and again I because that means telling us what you are. Um, and again I not that I'm not trying to di direct it one way or another here. So um, if I would just I know what, how Mark feels about it, but I just think we all ought to either d discuss it or. Uh, put a motion that we do take that into account. I, I think it's probably uh, a good idea because one of the things that I think you did bring up is that this board has to make sure that it maintains credibility. And I don't know that um, I really, you know, want to make, you know, that we have it being skewed one way or the other, at least the perception. I am not the least bit worried that you're going to skew it anyway. 
No, but I think we do, there is, the perception is, is reality. So I just want to make sure that you all give that some thought and see how you want to deal with that. Before we pass a ballot around to put a name down on there that you want as chair, I think we need to have that discussion. So I just want to toss in, I think what Mark said was important, um, especially in regards to um, ensuring that everyone feels inclusive. But I will say that when I walked in the door, as the leader of the NAACP, we are nonpartisan. And so typically when I walk in the door in this type of a setting, the party does not take any, I don't take any consideration to the party. It's a nonpartisan um, group. And so having to do a level of separation automatically creates the separation. I think the conversation is, for me is more tied to are we in agreement to operate from a nonpartisan yeah, that's fine, I, and I think that's a it's a great, great point. So that's why I'm throwing it out to this group. Yes, Bruce. Mr. Chairman, I I, I think uh, I, I tend to agree with Esther on this. That uh, I think we need to be agnostic as far as party goes, and I think that can be accomplished by anonymity. You know, uh, okay. by not declaring party, uh, then there wouldn't be any bias. So uh, I right. that would be my feedback. Okay. Is uh, I just think we need to be party agnostic on okay. this. Um, and again, I think, uh, and I will wait if anybody else wants to weigh in, but I, um, at this point, I would, you know, unless I, there's a motion to the contrary, we would just move forward without any kind of identification of anything and just pick a chair and vice chair. So uh, I didn't want to cut anybody off if anybody else has any. Yes, Mary Louise, go ahead. Um, I would take the other position, and that's why I put my background in what I said. Okay. Um, I think you are correct that it would probably not make any difference within this group. However, I think it would make a difference to the people listening okay. and the people who have strong feelings about what's happening. So for that point, I would say that it would be a better thing okay. to do. I appreciate, appreciate that position. Uh, yes, Ron. I'm independent since I got here. I didn't know who to vote for when I landed in uh, Palm Harbor never moved. Um, I've worked with everybody. Just I don't know what that gets you, but just throwing it out there. Um, so if I don't, um, if I don't hear a motion in a second to put the 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 the, the, um, the motion to put the idea of of having one of the two officers, if you will, the chair or the vice chair, a Republican, the other Democrat or Democrat and Republican, um, then we, if I don't hear a motion on that uh, in a second for a vote, then I'm just gonna go ahead and move on with the vote of chairmanship. So um, I'm not hearing a motion for identifying party or making it as the chair of one and, and vice chair for the other. So, uh, and I'm, again, let's move forward with a, a vote. Do we have, um, yes, did you have any comment, Way? Uh, I did. I, I think I saw uh, staff handing out pieces of paper to everybody okay, so uh, as, as ballots. What I was going to ask to comply with the Sunshine Law, all right, is uh, you need to write two things on that piece of paper. You need to write your own name, okay? And then you need to write who you're voting for, all right? And indicate which one is which. Put your name and then say voting for, colon, and then write who you're voting for. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna, we are essentially gonna vote for the chairmanship. Um, uh, Mark and Ron and Esther and Mary Louise and Brian all said that they were willing to serve. So um, uh, the others did not. So I would say limit it to Mark, Ron, Esther. So Mar what? One point of, of, of um, qualification, clarification. Go ahead. We're voting for the chairman. Chairman, but, but only. not the vice chair. We're, we're only voting for the chairman okay. this time, and then we'll vote for the vice chairman. And chairman, if I could give, if I could give one more recommendation on this, uh, I think ultimately, unless there is, unless there is a majority that comes out of a five vote or a five person run here. I'd recommend you have a second round of voting with the top two. Okay, fair enough. Unless there's any objection. Unless, unless uh, somebody has six votes. Yeah. 
then exactly. we will then we'll take the top two and uh, have another vote. I, I, I would suggest you would all feel more comfortable that ultimately the chair was elected by a majority of the entire board. So that would be two rounds. Okay. That's Attention. what we'll do then. I think that's a I think that's a good idea. Um, so just go ahead and, and put your name on there and tell you who you're voting for. And um, um, yeah, could you please collect and then uh, give it to to Wade so that Wade can let us know the outcome. I was, my goal was to be out of your hair by 6.30 and I don't think I'm gonna make it. Sorry about that. <laughs> ballots for a second round or for the vice chair, that would be great. And I'm going to assume that um, the person that we choose as chair, uh, the other the other four uh, all expressed interest in vice chair as well. So um, we'll do a vote among the remaining four, assuming we get a majority here. Chairman, we have uh, six votes for uh, Brian, I apologize, I can't read the last name, Brian Onkst. 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 Yes. Okay. We have six votes for Brian Onkst, three votes for um, Esther, and one vote for Ron. I'm sorry, I just wrote down their first names. Okay. So I would That's suggest in this, in this one here, we have a majority vote yeah. for an individual for okay. chair. So should we confirm that with a... That's all we need. That that's fine with me. I think you said the rule before was if we get a majority, that person would be the chair. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, chair uh, Brian Angst, um, and um, uh, so there are four remaining folks. Uh, would be uh, Mark, Ron, Esther, and Mary Louise. Uh, so if we could um, write that down, I, and then and then I'm gonna uh, back out and turn it over to the. Chair of the meeting yeah. for the, uh, to do the rest of the meeting. So. So, Chair, what's your first act going to be? Well, Mr. Chairman, would, would you like uh, me to uh, preside over the election of the vice chair, or would you? I, I'll, I'll finish that, and then uh, then it's all yours. Thank you, sir. I just want to thank you all. Uh, this is incredibly humbling. Um, 
you all are amazing public servants. And uh, I know this is going to be a collective whole. You know, it's not going to be a divisive group of uh, different differences. We're going to work together, and I look forward to that. And that's what this is all about. It's about working together. Uh, and at the end of the day, we provide the best work product possible for the people of Pinellas County to the County Commission, and then the County Commission makes the best decision possible for the people. So thank you so much. I really look forward to working with you all. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Congratulations. Yep, no problem. Um, as a side note, down at the supervisor of elections, we uh, the supervisor asked for a another system down there that would, was going to be used as the uh, kind of does the audit for the our main machine that does all the equipment. And um, <laughs> this discussion about somebody said, well, maybe it should be counted by hand. And I said, oh my goodness, you see what's happening when you count it by hand? <laughs> not that they're not doing a fine job of counting the ballots. Um, uh, but the, the, the systems themselves, it was just amazing to see the work that they do and where there was any issue at all, you could click on the screen and it would show the ballots that were in question that had gone through the canvassing board for determination. It was just amazing. And of course, the numbers were mirrored exactly almost within one difference and it was because of an over and under and they showed it up on the screen and you could see exactly what that difference was. So the original machine did their its job and the audit machine confirmed it with that one exception, one vote, they showed it on the screen and we confirmed why that was the difference. And it was just, it was really reassuring that you know, that the, the results are as they are intended to be. Yes, Wade. Chairman, yes. Uh, we have, and I apologize for the first names, okay. but uh, we have uh, seven votes for Esther, two Mar votes for Mark, and one vote for Ron. Okay. Well, so we knew, we have our vice chair, Esther, Eugene. Thank you for agreeing to step up. Thank you, family. Yeah. Appreciate no that. Yeah. So we have our chair, uh, Brian Angst, our vice chair, Esther Eugene. And I am finished, and I look forward to your work over the next few months, and, uh, and uh, do, do good work for the residents of Pinellas County. And God bless each one of you. Thank you. We will do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. God bless you. Members, thank you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to serve with you. Congratulations, Esther. Thank you for your service. Um, and I know we're going to do great work, uh, as uh, Chairman Eggers uh, instructed us to do. Um, the next uh, item on the agenda is the presentation of the Sunshine Law and Public Records Act, which will be uh, conducted by Mr. Wade Voss. Board members, I'm going to go ahead and do this from the podium, actually. It looks like you should have the PowerPoint presentation in your packets. There we go. Once again, good evening, board members. As I mentioned before, my name's Wade Vos. I'm going to be serving as your uh, counsel throughout this process and very happy to be here with you today. The first thing we're going to be doing is uh, the rite of passage that every government board has to go through. Uh, actually, first off, show of hands, if you would, uh, board members who've served on other boards that are subject to the Sunshine Law and Public Records and so on. Good, I'll go very quickly then. Um, so in my firm, I'm the one who gets the, uh, who 
pulls the short straw and has to do the four hour public records, sunshine law, and ethics training for city and county commissioners, okay? We are not going to be doing the four hour training presentation today. This is an incredibly pared down presentation to get at very much the basics of what you all need to know, uh, really just to keep you out of trouble or do our best to. Um, however, I do want to encourage you if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to jump in and ask because I, I find particularly with these issues, it's a lot of exposure to it and it's really thinking through it and asking questions that helps understand and internalize these things. So we're gonna start out by talking about the government of the sunshine or the open meetings law, all right? So what is the sunshine law? It basically provides a right of access to certain governmental proceedings, all right? It actually comes from the Florida Constitution and it's memorialized in Chapter 286 of the Florida Statutes. It applies, and this is very important because I hear this all the time when I travel around the state and folks don't seem to get this, it applies both to elected and appointed boards, okay? So you all, none of you are elected officials, but nevertheless, you are subject to the Sunshine Law the same way the Board of County Commissioners of Pinellas County is. So we definitely need to keep this in mind and, and do our best to stay on the straight and narrow with regard to this. I just realized I forgot my water. Local government law is a thirsty business, so. The general rule of the Sunshine Law is all meetings at which official acts are taken or public business is transacted or discussed have to be open and noticed to the public, all right? Now that's a general rule. We're gonna break down some specifics here. What does the Sunshine Law apply to? It applies to any meeting, and we're gonna talk about what a meeting is, all right? It's kind of a term of art when it comes to the Sunshine Law. Between two or more members of the same board, now this is very important, all right, all the time I get questions. Oh, hey, I'm on this board and this other person's on this other board. They both vaguely have to do with similar subjects. I'm not allowed to talk to them about things, right, because of the Sunshine Law. That is not the rule, all right? Now, there may be other reasons, number of other reasons why you may choose not to or limit what you talk about and so on. Um, but when it comes to, or how you talk with, with folks, but when it comes to the, the straight application of the Sunshine Law, it only applies to communications, either direct or indirect, and we'll get into that, between two or more members of the same board. So we're talking about two or more of you all talking about a matter. And what matters does it apply to? It applies when discussing matters that may foreseeably come before that board, okay? And this varies with every board, all right? When it comes to, for example, let's take a big broad example, the Board of County Commissioners for Pinellas County. Basically, any matter that may relate to county business, they have a broad portfolio, all right? So we can reasonably assume that a matter concerning county business could foreseeably come before that board. With you all, your focus, while very important, is much more limited, okay? You all could talk generally about some issue or other that had to do with, say, county politics, so long as it did not have anything to do with the business of this board, which is relating to uh, redistricting efforts. You could talk about the Florida Gators. You could talk about the weather. You could talk about national politics. You can talk about state politics, generally, okay? Now, at the same time, I will caution you all right, and, and kind of accepted levels vary around the state, and I do a lot of traveling around the state. Members of the public sometimes perceive, notwithstanding what the law actually is, they'll perceive if they see two members of a board chatting about something, they may worry that there's some problem with that. I'm not suggesting that if you see each other in the aisle in public that you have to run the other way by any stretch. But what I really would suggest is uh, parking lot lobbying is what I tend to see it as. Because oftentimes folks seem to think when you're on a board 
you've discussed a matter and you've kind of dealt with that particular issue, you say, oh, well, it's all done now. It's not going to come before the board now. We've done it. So run off and chat about it or you're just you're very interested exci or excited about something that had gone on. And so as you're walking out to the parking lot, you say, man, I can't believe that went down that way or this or that or what have you. I would suggest strongly against those conversations. Why? Not suggesting they're going to take you away in irons for it or anything like this, but it is potentially going to leave an impression in the minds of the public that the important business that you all are doing isn't going on in here, but really going on out there. And we don't want that impression at all. And we certainly don't want to do it so we can comply with the law. Now, we were talking about the Sunshine Law applying to any meeting. What does that mean? Well, this is a meeting, all right? Uh, should be easy enough, you know, commission meetings, board meetings, and so on. Also, workshops. Whenever you hear a, a county commission or a board or what have you call something a workshop, that's still a meeting under the Sunshine Law. It's just generally understood to mean, hey, at this meeting, we're just going to bounce around ideas, but we're not going to take any final action. Nevertheless, that type of meeting is still subject to Sunshine Law. What other types of meetings are we talking about? Now we're going to get into, quote unquote, meetings that aren't going to be able to comply with the rules we're going to talk about the Sunshine Law has to comply with, all right? So what are these other types of meetings? Telephone calls, text messages, emails, or written correspondence back and forth between two or more members of the same board when discussing matters that may foreseeably come before that board. Okay, so what we're talking about, just as I suggested to you all, don't talk about the business of this board after this meeting gets over, talk about it in the parking lot. Don't talk about it on the telephone either. Don't talk about it in an email either or in text messages to each other. Now, I'm not suggesting if, for example, a member, um, you know, happened to already know, say, the chair or some other member and said, hey, I'm running five minutes late and they text and say, I'm running five minutes late. That's not a per se violation of the Sunshine Law. But when you've got communications back and forth talking about matters that may foreseeably come before the board, that is where we're going to get into concerns. And as it mentions there, not just actual final agreements, hey, if you vote for this, I'll vote for this, but even informal discussions, verbally or otherwise, about matters that may foreseeably come before that board, we want to stay away from any of those discussions outside of a notice public meeting. So what are the requirements to comply with the Sunshine Law? There are three traditional requirements, and then there's a fourth requirement that was just added a couple years ago. We'll talk about that both in the context of the Sunshine Law here and then in your rules discussion we're going to have in a little bit. But the three historical basic requirements are meetings of public boards or commissions have to be open to the public. All right. Reasonable notice of the meetings have to be given, and minutes of the meetings must be taken, promptly recorded, and open to public inspection. The nice thing for you all is if you confine your discussions about matters that may foreseeably come before the board to meetings like this, then all three of these requirements are all being handled by staff for you. There's nothing for you to do. We've got county staff here who are taking minutes, and those are promptly recorded and open public inspection. Notice of these meetings, reasonable notice is being provided, and meetings are being arranged uh, to be open to the public in everything that that means. I'm going to skip ahead a couple pages here. What does that mean for it to be open to the public? Location has to be accessible to the public, has to be adequate size. As you can see here, I think we estimated the size well for tonight. And of course, the um, place where you're going to have those meetings can't discriminate or restrict access to the public. And all of these matters, Pinellas County is very well versed in making this work out incredibly well. And of course, during the pandemic, uh, we've been making additional efforts throughout the state in Pinellas County. This meeting is streaming live tonight and so on. So um, that's how we comply with that uh, open to the public requirement. Now, as we uh, mentioned before, both elected and appointed boards are subject to the Sunshine Law. And another 
thing I hear all the time that is simply not the case. I hear folks say, oh, well, our work's just advisory. Somebody else is going to make the final decision, so it doesn't matter uh, if we violate the Sunshine Law. The Sunshine Law doesn't apply to us. That is simply not the case. Even when it comes to government boards that are advisory in nature, they are subject to all the requirements of the Sunshine Law. Now, we talked about two or more members of the board talking with each other about matters that may foreseeably come before that board. What about third parties that are going between two or more members? This is the bad word that we local government attorneys use, a conduit, okay? We're talking about situations, and they, there's various levels of the scale here where you've got an individual who's not a member of the board, but that individual is talking to two or more members of the board, or is going to, and potentially passing notes or messages or whatever between those members. This is also wildly illegal under the Sunshine Law, okay? And I'm gonna give you some examples. To give you some examples, because my advice to each of you is to stay far away from any and all of it, okay? So I'll give you an extreme example. So you have two board members, you got a member of the public. The board member one goes to member of the public and say, hey, go tell board member two if he supports my proposition on this thing, I'll support his proposition on this other thing. Okay? Right there. Without ever communicating anything to the other party, right there even asking someone else to do that was a violation of the Sunshine Law. Okay? Now, did public official two commit a violation of the Sunshine Law? No, they had nothing to do with it, all right? But that first one asked the member of the public to go do that. Person one committed a violation of the Sunshine Law. Now, let's say person one asked member of the public to do it. Member of the public goes trooping over to uh, public official two and says, hey, uh, board member one says, uh, says, if you do this, then I'll do that. I'll give you a couple different scenarios. Let's say board member two says, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, you go and tell them, you know, I'm good. Now board member two has undoubtedly committed a violation of the Sunshine Law, even before it's communicated back, all right? What my advice to you all would be, if you ever get in that circumstance, and of course, we're never gonna get in the circumstance that any of you are going to ask anyone to pass any messages to anybody else, all right? But if, you ever get in a situation where someone approaches you, member of the public, other public officials, anybody, approaches you wanting to tell you either or purporting to tell you that one of your fellow board members wanted to communicate something to you about work that that's, could foreseeably come before this board. If anybody ever approaches you to try to tell you that information, you immediately, mid-sentence, call timeout. Say, nope, can't hear it, stop what you're saying, can't talk about it. You can be nice about it, but stop a mid-sentence. Just say, I'm sorry, I can't talk about that, what have you. Now, does this mean people, the members of the public can't come talk to you about the important work you're gonna be doing? No, they can come talk to you. Absolutely, they can come talk to you. That's one of the reasons that we're gonna be taking public input, okay? Um, but what you want to be cautious of is not when a member of the public come up, comes in and says, hey, I've looked at these things and I think you ought to do X, Y, and Z. That's great, that's great public comment, okay? Um, what's bad public input is when outside of a notice public meeting, a member of the public comes to you and says, hey, I ought to think, I think you ought to do X, Y, and Z and uh, board member so-and-so and board member so-and-so have already told me that they are on board with that. When somebody tries to start telling you where other board members are, okay, my advice to you again, stop the conversation immediately and say, I can't talk about this. I don't want to have anything to do with this, okay? So that is my basic advice on how to deal with with conduits or anyone 
intentionally or unintentionally. Now keep in mind, members of the public in particular, they don't know all these rules. So they may think that this is just fine. So don't assume that anybody coming to you doing this is doing it out of some nefarious intent, okay? They haven't heard this little presentation. They don't study this stuff for a living, what have you. But just nicely, politely stop and say, I can't listen to this, I can't talk to you about this. One thing to keep in mind as well, and I recall in my time actually in this very room, like five years ago, uh, when I was representing the Pinellas County Charter Review Commission, we had some of this. It is uh, the case, one of the implications of the Sunshine Law, these meetings being open to the public, is that members of the public can come in and um, audio record, photograph, or video record meetings, okay? You all have heard before, oh, well, it's a, you know, Florida's a two-party consent state, um, you know, for recording audio and all this stuff. Your being here is consent. They can, they can record it pursuant to the Sunshine Law. So it, is, it has been the case in Pinellas County in the past where I saw folks trooping in with whole big camera setups and all of this, very professional gear. You know, and I said, oh, well, county staff's here to record this one. Oh, no, that's just uh, some members of the public. They're just getting really high quality shots. Totally allowed to do it under the Sunshine Law. Now, one last thing to talk about in the Sunshine Law of uh, what requirements are. There was a new section added, new requirement added by the Florida legislature in 2013 that gives members of the public a reasonable opportunity opportunity to be heard on a proposition that comes before the board. Now, why they added this, I'm not particularly sure, because every government entity I've ever worked for already had it built into their rules, but they decided to build into the statute, fine. Now, complying with the statute is actually very minimal, and I'm going to give you advice to probably do it a little bit more than what the statute says is the minimum. The minimum requirement is that you, requ that you allow public comment not necessarily at the same meeting that you're taking your final official action, okay? You just have to allow them to have public comment at a meeting during the decision-making process and it's in reasonable proximity of time to when you take the official action. I think that's too complicated by half. My recommendation is really simple, and it's what most every local government does, allow public comment at every meeting. Let people say their piece, and you've heard what they've had to say. Um, it, of course, the statute expressly states that uh, it does not prohibit a board or the chair from maintaining orderly conduct or decorum at a meeting. We are allowed to establish rules concerning how that public comment works, and um, we'll discuss that a little bit with some proposed rules that we've put together uh, in a later agenda item here. But basically, uh, with regard to that, we can provide for time limits for the public comment. Uh, we can have procedures, which I read this part to be non-mandatory. It's an opportunity for the chair to allow big groups of people, if they want to, to be able to pick a representative and come up and speak and so on. This happens, this happens at planning and zoning meetings is when it is, when you have 200 people show up and they could have 200 people stand up and take their three minutes each or the chair could say, look, all of you people, I'll give your best speaker 15 minutes to come up here and speak if that's cool for everybody and you all don't have to get up here for two hours. The statute gives that flexibility. So why do we follow the Sunshine Law? follow Sunshine Law because we all want to follow the law, right? But of course there are penalties as well. The criminal penalty for individuals who violate the Sunshine Law is, who knowingly violate the Sunshine Law, is that it's a second degree misdemeanor. Now I've actually had in meetings sometimes people say, oh, second degree misdemeanor, that's not much. Well, it's not much until you get that call from the state attorney's office and then it just ruins your whole year. So my suggestion, stay far away from any of it. It's not worth it. It really doesn't work to accomplish anything nefarious, and it's only asking for trouble. So just stay far away from it. Even if there's an unintentional violation of the Sunshine Law, 
it can be a non-criminal infraction with a $500 civil penalty. There's also another, oh, one last thing I want to mention about this as well. Remember the conduits we were talking about before, those individuals that go between either at the behest of, of a, uh, another board member or just because they're trying to get in the middle of it to pass notes back and forth between board members? They're not subject to the Sunshine Law, which means, and this actually got litigated over where I live in Orange County uh, relatively recently. Somebody was alleged to be going between two members of a board and he got prosecuted by the state attorney over there for violating the Sunshine Law. Judge threw it out, said that it was, that the Sunshine Law does not apply to folks who are not public officials. Each of you are public officials in your capacity as members of this county redistricting board. So you are subject to the criminal penalties of Sunshine Law. Some member of the public is not. So keep in mind, it's you all on the hook. In addition, there are penalties for the government and for the work, the good work that you all are going to be doing. The Sunshine Law provides that, there, that no resolution, rule, regulation, or formal action shall be considered binding except as taken or made at an open meeting. That seems reasonable enough, but there's the courts further extrapolate that. They say that courts have, courts have held that when a Sunshine Law violation is found, within the process of the decision making, courts can go in and find the entire action void ab initio. That's Latin for void from the beginning. It basically can take and derail the entire good work and the good process that everybody had been going through. So again, we wanna do our best to stay away from any of that. And that's what I've got to say about the Sunshine Law. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. So I served on a planning and zoning board, which can be quite fun for five years, mm -hmm. and actually had a resident file an ethics violation complaint against me, which was dismissed by the state as frivolous, because anybody can do it. Sure. So are we subject to those types of complaints if someone were to choose to file one in this position? That's an outstanding question. The question was yeah. the, the question was whether, and I believe the answer is yes. And I, I, I'll give you a be glad to give you a further answer at your next meeting. It's a great because this board is relatively unique. I would default to saying yes. The question was whether or not um, whether or not members of the public could hypothetically file ethics complaints with the Florida Commission on Ethics. A, against any of you for alleged ethical violations of chapter 112, which is the ethics statutes. Uh, I'm going to default to saying yes, and we're not going to spend the two hours I normally spend going through chapter 112 ethics. Your primary issue might be, although I can't conceive how it would be, uh, voting conflicts, um, but I, I can't conceive that. If I see any of those even coming down the pike in any way, I will do my best to pull anybody aside. Yeah, and th this was just being used as a tactic because they didn't like the way things were going. So and and unfortunately, that won't here. <laughs> unfortunately, it's, unfortunately, sometimes folks use good tools badly. Any Attorney other questions? Booth, um, yes, sir. This may not be directly on point, but one of the questions that came to my mind are, some of us have been on these boards that are subject to the Form 1 filing. Are we gonna be subject to that as well? That was the exact same, qu that, that those are part and parcel in my analysis of, of that. Um, I, uh, it's let a financial me, disclosure uh, form that we need to file with either the local supervisor of elections or with the state. Yeah, part, part, of, what, um, part of what governs that, it, it's governed by provisions in Chapter 112, but it's driven in part by the main government that you're aboard for, how and what they report. Okay, because the, the enforcement mechanism is they report you as a Form 1 filer and then it and so on. So I'm going to confer with the county to see whether or not they believe this board is characterized as a Form 1 uh, filing board. And okay. I'll let you all know. Very good. And one other question just for all of our benefit. You know, obviously you represent the board. You don't represent Brian Unks, the individual. You represent 
the board as a whole. Yep. If we have specific questions about potential voting conflicts or ethical concerns that we have, can we reach out to you individually and ask you those as our as part of our board, a role in the board? Is that okay? The answer is absolutely yes. So that's for everyone to know. If you ever have an issue, feel free to call Mr. Bose and, and discuss that with him. And thank you very much for bringing that up, Chairman, because that, that's where I normally wrap up in this. Uh, so uh, primarily with regard to Sunshine Law and public records, but yes, if, if there's any ever any thought that crosses your mind, anything ethics compliance wise or otherwise with regard to the substance of any of the law we're working with and so on, uh, any one of you is welcome to pick up the phone and give me a call and we'll talk through it. As Chair uh, mentioned, I represent the board, but part of how I represent the board is providing legal advice to, to you individually with regard to these matters. So, thank you. If there's no other questions, I'm going to very quickly hit the public records law, and then I will be done with this. And then we'll move on to rules. So the public records law, which again also comes from uh, initially from the Florida Constitution, then was memorialized in Chapter 119 of the Florida Statutes, provides a right of access to records of state and local government applies to um, all the different branches of govern government, but in different ways. From a local government standpoint, it applies to public records as we define them, all right? So what is a public record and how does that interact with you all? This is the statutory definition. Public records include all documents, papers, letters, maps, books, tapes, photographs, films, sound recordings, data processing software. This is the Florida legislature in the 1970s trying to guess the future, okay? Or other material, regardless of the physical form, characteristics, or means of transmission, made or received pursuant to law or ordinance or in connection with the transaction of official business by any agency, all right? Now, what's an agency? This board is an agency. Under the statute, each one of you individually is an agency as a member of the board. It's really weird definition, okay? But what does this mean? It means that any documents, papers, books, maps, or anything else like this made or received pursuant to law or ordinance or in connection with the transaction of official business is a public record, and we'll talk about what that means. Now, I'm gonna dispel a couple myths here, all right? So, I hear it all the time, hey, I'm on this board, a lot of public interest, somebody tracked down my personal email address and they sent me uh, an email about the business of the board. Is that email a public record? Yes, it is, okay? Did that one email infect the rest of my entire email box, and now members of the public can go digging through my personal emails? Absolutely not, okay? The uh, Pinellas County has actually made it very easy for you all, as I understand it, county staff have set up individual email addresses for county email addresses for each of you to work on, that's, that's right, Kevin, right? to work on the business of this board. I strongly recommend that you do that. Why? It makes it incredibly easy for you to not have to worry about public records, okay? Because all of those emails that you send or receive relating to business of this board is all gonna be in the county system. If and when there is a public records request, you don't even have to worry about it. County staff's gonna handle going through and pulling those out of those emails and handle that, and you don't have to worry about a thing. My recommendation to you would be if you got that hypothetical email from a member of the public to your personal email address, because somehow they figured it out, take that email and forward it to your Pinellas County redistricting board email address. So it's in there, and then now the county can, uh, they're responsible for the retention of it. You don't ever have to worry about it again. Public records, 99% of them anymore all have to do with emails, okay? So 
you do that, you're going to be on the right track to complying with the Public Records Act. Not a, not a yes, sir. So does it matter which device you use to access it? Like, for example, you can set up the county email that's been established for us on your phone if you choose to. But as long as it's contained in, on that Microsoft Exchange server, I'm assuming it's contained. Right. The rest yeah, of the and, information. And I don't know all the technical <laughs> bits and bobs of it, but uh, I assume if it's an Exchange server, yeah, you'd be able to set that up on your phone. Yep. It'll be in there. You can access it, but they're always going to keep a copy. So you're good from the public records retention standpoint. And uh, again, setting that up on your phone does not infect the rest of your phone. It does not mean members of the public can just go prowling through your text messages or anything like this. Uh, now, Mr. Vosa, uh, one yes, of the sir. things, this is a very important topic. I know Mr. Lowak has sent us emails regarding the county setup. Uh, I don't see that on the agenda, but I felt like after Mr. Vos is done with his presentation on the public records, it might be good to have Mr. Lowak or the appropriate county official describe the email system that they have set up for us, is, unless you all feel comfortable with it already, but it's up to you. Do, you. do you need additional information about the county set up email? You're good? Everybody's good? Okay. All right. And if we need questions related to that? I'd like some additional discussion on it. Okay. Uh, this is my first time dealing with a county email. Thank so maybe you. Mr. Locke can give us a five-minute presentation on that. Is that okay? Or the appropriate person? After Mr. Vos is done with sir. his presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, so to turn back to that definition for a second here, the Florida Supreme Court's interpreted that broad definition there to encompass all materials made or received by an ag agency in connection with official business which are used to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge. And I mention that because sometimes we use that to really analyze edge cases of whether or not things are public records. Now, all this material, regardless of whether it's in final form, now, this usually applies more to staff than anything else, because I get it all the time. Oh, hey, we got a public record of this thing. Well, I'm not done with it. It's still got my notes in there that says this guy is a bad person and all of this and whatever. Too bad. Um, there is no, it's a draft exception. So um, really, the point with regard to public records when we're talking about emails or anything you're putting down in writing, we had an old saying at the University of Florida, don't put in writing anything you don't want to see on the front page of the alligator. That was the, that was the local newspaper. Um, don't put down anything in writing that you don't want somebody seeing, because it's very possible. I'll just share with you. It is uh, very possible, even likely, that somebody is going to make a public records request for all the emails you send and receive, and it's going to be really easy for them to do that because, as it mentions there. There is no, this is really embarrassing exemption from the Public Records Act, okay? There are a number of exemptions, but pretty much all of them are not going to apply to the work of this board. All sorts of ones for social security numbers, bank account numbers, protected health information, all manner of different things. There's a whole book of all the different exemptions, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any that would apply to this board. So. Responding to public records requests can be really easy for the county. For these, they're just going to give a copy of basically everything. So anything you put down in writing, be sure you want people to see it. And as we talked about emails, emails definitively are public records and end up most of the time being exactly what we're looking at when we're looking at public records requests. Now, we're going to talk about a more fraught area, Facebook. Okay. This is startling to some people. If you were to make posts on Facebook with your personal account, okay, to discuss the business of this board, I would advise you that that post is a public record. It's not the end of the world. Okay? It's not illegal to post it. Perfectly legal to post it. But what does that mean when I say it's a public record? It means you have some duties. And this is why sometimes people decide it's best 
not to impose those duties on themselves by posting the business of the board on Facebook. When you are in possession of a public record, and the thing about Facebook is Pinellas County doesn't have access to your Facebook account, okay? And doesn't have a meaningful way to retain those posts. So the requirements, what's incumbent upon anyone who possesses a public record is, or who is in custody of it, they have to permit that record to be inspected and copied by any person desiring to do so at any reasonable time, under reasonable conditions, and under the supervision of the custodian of the public records. You notice all those reasonables? This was definitely written by a lawyer, okay? Um, but what it means is you post on Facebook, you have an obligation to retain that, and if there's a public records request for anything that would be responsive to it, to provide it to the county to be able to turn it over to somebody asking for it. Now, it could be as simple as to retain it, screenshotting that page. Okay, so if you wanted to do it, my advice to you would be screenshot that page. Here is another issue that I'm going to caution you all about, and this is a rewind to our Sunshine Law discussion, all right? Let's say one of you posts something on Facebook, all right? And you're not telling any tales out of school, it's some issue you thought what you were, you know, thought was very important, you brought it up in a meeting, you just you know, say it in the thing, I think it's very important we do X on the Facebook post. Perfectly fine. It's a public record. You need to retain it somehow in case there's a public uh, records request for it. Now, let's say a discussion ensues. What do you think happens if then another member of the board sees that, say your Facebook friends, all right? And by the way, it is not illegal for you all to be Facebook friends if you happen to be. All right, but this is where I caution you. If one of you sees one of those posts, I'll say another board member says, no, I disagree. I think we ought to do Y instead. There we just created a problem under the Sunshine Law. Why? Because we just had a back and forth between two or more members of the same board about a matter that may foreseeably come before that board outside of a notice public meeting. Okay? So, one thing that I would strongly recommend against in any event, if you happen to see a post by a fellow board member, not saying you can't read it, you can read it, anybody can read it, it's out there, don't respond to it. So that's our, our nexus and synergy, if you will, between Sunshine Law and the Public Records Act and Facebook. Now, what are the penalties when it comes to the Public Records Act. Well, there are penalties for the government, ultimately. They can be sued, and uh, when they bring that suit, they seek to recover attorney's fees. That's always the big hammer. In addition, a knowing violation of the Public Records Act by, for example, members of a board is a first-degree misdemeanor, so more serious than a Sunshine Law violation. Surprisingly, I've always been a little baffled by that, but. In any event, a first-degree misdemeanor, uh, up to one year in prison or a $1,000 fine or both. And that's all I've got to tell you about the Public Records Act, unless there are any questions. Any more questions? Yes, Mr. Olivier. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Bose, just a quick question and clarification. How about meeting materials, um, things that we are dealing with here this evening and say we're, we're taking notes uh, mm -hmm. during the meeting? If we take that with us, is that subject to public record? This is an outstanding question. Thank you very much for asking it. So your notes, and I'm going to make a distinction here, okay? Because a lot of people, after I give this advice, they become less prolific note takers, all right? When, if you are in the course of your work, either in this meeting or afterwards when you're home looking through stuff, and you start taking prolific notes, I think we ought to do this, I think we ought to do this, uh, this is what I think about this, and so on and so on. Those notes, even to yourself, all right, when they are in long form and formalized, are public records. Why? 
If you look back at this definition, remember I told you we look back to these definitions to think through some of these things? All materials made or received by an agency in connection with official business that are used to perpetuate, communicate, communicates when you give it to somebody else. Folks think, oh no, if I just write it out all to myself, big, long, whatever, and I don't give it to anybody else, it's not a public record. No. Once you give it to somebody else, it becomes a public record because of the communicate part. But if you did either of the other thing, things, perpetuate or formalize, it's also a public record, even if you haven't shared it with anybody else. So when you do your long form notes, what I would advise you is your obligation, you don't have to go scream from the rooftops and you know, show it to everybody, sua sponte, just out, out of the blue. But if a public records request comes for your notes concerning a matter, your obligation during the pendency of this entire um, business of this board is to retain, hold on to copies of those notes. And then my advice to you would be, when you are done with this board, take those notes, hand them over to county staff so you never have to think about them again. And then you don't have to think about it again. Now I'm gonna contrast it with something else. If you were gonna come in and you were gonna make three points at a meeting, okay? And you had a little post-it note and you wrote down tick and you wrote like two words, another tick, another two words, all right? Just to jog your own memory, to remind yourself. The Attorney General's office has generally found little notes to yourself to temporarily jog your own memory with regard to something you're gonna say in a meeting, not to be uh, not to be public records and not to be subject to public records requests and so on. Because they found basically that those don't perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge. Now I'll give you one last example, which I beg you not to do. This has to do with notes again, but it's passing notes amongst yourselves, okay? And I say, I beg you not to do it, it sounds ridiculous, right? I've physically been in meetings where this has occurred, and it's occurred in plain view of the camera and members of the public to deleterious effect, okay? I had one member of a board, I'm not even gonna get specific about it, but had one member of a board, they had just had a very contentious argument or a contentious vote on something, and they were hot. They are you know, some more angry about it. And one of them, wrote a note and somewhat ostentatiously passed the note to another member of that same board in the meeting on camera, okay? Well, what do you think happened? Somebody came up and said, I wanna see that note because they knew the rules. And do you know what the time, uh, the time allowances for a government or government agency to produce a public record is? So we mentioned there it's within a reasonable time. Well, reasonable time on a big request that might be subject to a lot of redactions and so on, could be days, could be weeks, all right? But a little piece of paper that had been communicated to somebody else, that it was clearly nothing exempt in it, under the law, reasonable's right then. And it's not just a right to make a copy of it, it's a right to inspect it, to see it, okay? So that person came up and said, I want to see that note. And the person who wrote the note and passed it flipped out, lost their mind, because what they had written was not very flattering to themselves, quite frankly, because they basically wrote, you're going to regret that. Now, did we have a sunshine law issue there too? Maybe. Do you, you see? Whispering amongst yourselves, and that's gonna be very difficult here, um, but whispering amongst yourselves off the mics or what have you about matters that will foreseeably come before the board, just as bad as doing it in the parking lot, so keep the conversations on the mics, but passing notes like that, no, no. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Any other questions for Attorney Bose? Thank you, sir. Right. And I know our time is, you know, very valuable tonight. Um, we've got a lot to do. So do we want to have just a very brief explanation of the county emails? Or I know, Mr. Weinkrantz, you want to hear about it? Or do we want to do it? If I could just address my question. Yeah, sure. Just, um, is it going to be uh, 
I'm sorry. Is it are those emails going to be push emails where I'll receive notification, or are we? Do we have individual accounts? Because I have like not. Sounds like we have to log in and create our own account. Uh, maybe we can get a brief explanation on that. That'd be very I've helpful. I've done the login, but I've not created the, my own personal account. Okay, thank you. I'll be back up to talk with you all about rules in just a second. But. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. On the email, um, you got a form that walked you through how to set it up. We're not gonna be pushing anything from that. We'll be sending emails to it, but you'll have to go and check to know that it's there. Um, there is a contact in the email that we sent you, uh, Mr. Dennis McLeod at BTC, at our internal uh, IT department, and they can help you if you have any trouble with anything like that. Brian and I can refer you to folks, but we're not the technical folks that could probably get into the details about that. But we'll be more than happy to connect you with someone who can help you if you have any trouble at all. My question was, uh, I logged in for the, uh, and got access to the, the limited material we've already seen, but I didn't know that I needed to set up my own personal account if everybody's seeing the same material all the time. That is your personal account. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody good on the email system? Okay, excellent. Thank okay, uh, Attorney Vos, <laughs> glad you didn't sit down. Uh, draft rules, uh, this is a three page document uh, with Mr. Bose's firm's letterhead. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, when uh, Mr. Spitzer and I were uh, chatting and uh, Kevin were chatting, we thought it might be uh, useful to give you all proposed draft rules, very simple, um, to, uh, to govern some of the basics of, of uh, how you operate your meetings. Um, what you have set forth in this memo is, in the first part, a breakdown of rules, and they're both procedural and substantive, really, um, that are um, set forth in the Pinellas County Charter. And I'm not going to go into the particulars there, particularly stuff concerning redistricting criteria, and so I'm going to stick primarily to our procedural rules here. You all have already chosen a chair and a vice chair, and um, it sets forth um, uh, what your quorum is for your meeting and so on, and um, then provides that the board may adopt other rules for its operations and proceedings as it deems desirable. And so what you have on page three of that memo are some rules that my office put together. These rules, again, very simple. These were based on the Pinellas County Charter Review Commission's 2015-2016 uh, rules. Uh, that were in turn based on uh, the uh, Pinellas County CRC's rules from, I guess, eight years prior. Uh, again, very, uh, uh, very bare bones, but primarily addressing a couple issues. One relating to public comment, as I mentioned, um, I, the statute requires, and I strongly encourage uh, public comment. Um, and uh, one thing that is required in the statute is if you're going to have rules that regulate it, for example, time limits and so on, that it be put down in writing. And so we have provision here. Also have provision for speaker sign in. Um, you can take or leave that as you'd like. This is how the uh, Charter Review Commission proceeded in their work, just so they have documentation. It's really to help staff to have documentation of who it is uh, that's speaking so they have their full name spelled out and so on. Um, and um, one thing to keep in mind, I, I will point out under public comment, under number one, uh, it states an opportunity for public comments shall be held at the beginning of each meeting for comments on issues that may come before the CRB or comments on a topic that is included on the CRB's agenda for that meeting. Two things I want to mention about it. One, that first part, comments on issues that may come before the CRB. This, this is kind of meant for if you were to have a general public comment period that you would not have minutes or hours or what have you of folks standing up here talking to you about mass mandates in the schools. That is not a matter you have any control about at all, even tangentially, even a little bit. And so I would recommend to you and I would advise you, you can say your public comment, general public comment, can be addressed to matters that is within the ambit of what this board can address. And then you have that other part, comments on the topic that's included in the CRB's agenda for that meeting. 
I will tell you something particular to the way what's built into these rules, and I'm not suggesting you have to do it because other boards do it differently in different places around the state. The way they handled public comment uh, generally, um, I apologize. Let me see here. Do, 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 do. Looking for one thing here. The way they handled public comment um, generally with the Charter Review Commission is they had public comment on all the items that were on their agenda at the beginning, as opposed to having it item by item. Now, keep in mind, with the Charter Review Commission, they would have five, seven, 15 items on an agenda, okay? It's likely not the case you all are gonna have five, seven, or 15 items on your agenda. You're, you're pretty focused in your work and what you're going to be at. So just keep in mind what that provides for here. Of course, if you wanna change course, in one of your meetings, you always can circle around and, and uh, make any tweaks to these rules later if you were to adopt them tonight. Yeah, Attorney Vos, I think that's yes, a, good, a good question for the board. So I was going to call for public comment on, on any item that was an action item. So if we were gonna take a vote, a motion in a second, is there any public comment? But the way the rules are written, the public comment for items on the agenda and not on the agenda is all at once at the beginning. So it's at the pleasure of the board. It, you know, we don't have to decide it right the second, but we have to decide it on this agenda item four, what the rules are gonna be. Um, so if anyone has a preference, I, I personally don't really have a extreme preference, although usually what I see is if it's, a, if it's an action item, each item has its public comment period uh, because we might discuss something later in the meeting that someone wants to talk about, but it's, it's up to you all. Is that fair, uh, Attorney Vos? Absolutely, and I would share, it is it is a common practice in other areas of the state where you do exactly as you say. You have public comment, you have a general public comment to matters that could come before that board, and then you have on action items, uh, public comment on those. I, I conform this one here to the way the Pinellas County Charter Review Commission did it, because cr frankly I was trying to follow the way things, at least in my observation, had worked on some Pinellas County boards in my experience. But again, it is completely at your will, whatever can Again, be it's up to you. If anyone has any feelings on it, I know you all have experience in public meetings, so. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, oh. uh, I, I would leave it to your discretion, but I would like to leave some option for the public to make comments somehow if they're not in the room because of the pandemic, just to take that into consideration. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah, I think that's right. Yes, sir, Mr. Everett. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think we should do it at the beginning of the meeting, but also for action items, I think there ought to be an allowance for public comment for, uh, for actionable items on the agenda. So I'm, I'm not partial either way. I've seen it both ways. I've seen it with the city of St. Pete where um, public comments are at the tail end of the meeting. And I've also seen it at the beginning. I, I would though, um, probably put some consideration to the time mm -hmm. of the public comments um, because three minutes can be very long if you have 20 people here or more. So just be mindful of that. I, I think that, you know, as chair, I would, as uh, attorney Vos said, I would want to make sure the comments were germane. So if it was something that was totally out of the orbit of redistricting, I would probably politely tell the speaker this isn't on topic. And then if you all disagree with me, I would, defer to you all, but um, I don't anticipate that happening. I've also seen, you know, as Mr. Vos said, uh, the 10 minute maximum for a group speaker, that's not in here. I don't know if we're gonna have that level of interest or um, that's not a lot, that's not in here, but I, I would be fine with saying, if you wanna have your three minutes and you have seven people that wanna give you a minute, and then those people are disqualified from speaking on that item, but you can get up to seven people to give you a minute and then you have a total of 10 minutes. Um, that's what I've seen in other jurisdictions uh, for a group speaker concept. Thoughts on that or? I like that, um, but I, but I, I uh, watching the horizon, I anticipate that we are going to um, garner a lot of public interest. Okay, on this topic. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. 
Well, and this does indicate that if, if, there, if we're taking comment cards at the beginning, that you do have the ability as chair to shorten the time limit. So if you see there's a big group or whatever, you do have the ability to regulate that. Okay. So is it, you know, that we're going to maybe take it uh, as it as it comes basis and, and as long as we all kind of feel that I'm running the meeting correctly, we'll defer to that as opposed to putting out in the rules, you get 10 minutes as a group speaker with up to one minute per person donating their time to you. Those people then would be disqualified from speaking on that item. Um, do you want to be very specific about it in the rules or do you want to be more kind of a, a, as a board uh, as you feel we run the me meeting correctly? Well, you know, uh-oh, Chair, I'm going to say that we, I will never oppose anything that you say during a meeting, so I'll always well, defer Please feel to free to, because I'm no. not perfect, please. <laughs> no, 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 not, 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 not unless we're at a place where we're having a discussion as a board and, and we're getting ready to take a vote, but certainly not to um, defer on something like that. I, again, I have seen it both ways, but I anticipate that there will be a large number of people here, mm -hmm. so we should really give consideration to timing and whether we take it at the top of the hour or bottom or each action item. Okay. So I was just gonna make a comment. So it sounds like the two changes that have been uh, floated related to the public comment section is to, to do uh, two things, to, to add a commentary at the beginning and or potentially at each action item, and then to add a group commentary of up to 10 minutes if with borrowed time that could be, my only suggestion there would be to, as shortened uh, at the chairman's at the uh, chair's discretion. Based and on the and my thought would be the commentary, if we do that action item model, and this is what the county commission does and most of the cities around here do, my thought would be the comments at the beginning would be items not on the agenda. So you wouldn't have people speaking on items on the agenda at the beginning. You would only have people speaking on items that are not on the agenda. If you wanted to have a comment about an item on the agenda, your comment would be during that agenda item. Is that okay? Attorney Vo's question. Um, yes, ma'am. In your experience, what would your suggestion be in regards to this? I, I would suggest the more common route is is to uh, have general public comment to to matters of the board, but not necessarily on, but not on the agenda at the beginning, and then uh, public comment on ag individual agenda items or individual action items at the point before you vote. I'd say that's the more common way, and that can easily be implemented if that's the will of the board. Okay, very good. Do we want to adopt a group speaker rule, or do we want to just play it by ear? Chairman's uh, discretion. Okay, that's fair enough. Okay, Mr. Vos, sorry to spend so much time on that. No, her. thank you. This, this is exactly the hashing out that we wanted to have. So um, w when we come to the point where I would uh, recommend to you all that you adopt it, uh, adopt uh, these draft rules. You can just give general direction to the change that we talked about there. I'll prepare a new version and you all can see it at the next meeting. So, so we will be we adopting these at the next meeting? Yes. Okay, and then yeah, my, my only other question. Drafting language in a meeting is never a great idea, right. so. My only other question you give me the, the direction, I'll make it happen. The majority vote number, I believe, is six in uh, C2. So unless I, my math is wrong, which it very well could be, but. Say that again, I'm sorry. I think uh, the majority vote would be six members of 11, right? How many members of this board do we have? 11. I thought we had 10. I'm counting 10. I think we have one person missing, maybe. Okay. I, I believe we must because there's 11 members, or there's supposed to be 11 members, so. That yeah, was my uh, other comment, Mr. Bosman. We did not do a, a roll call vote at the beginning of the meeting, just a, a point of order. What's that? We didn't, we never did a roll call vote for who's present. But it, it worked out well for it because each of you said your names at the beginning. So. Mr. Vos, but, do you have any other uh, comments for us on the proposed rules? Uh, let me see here. One thing I will point out, and this was uh, subsection E, was an addition that the Charter Review Commission added uh, in 2015-16. It wasn't really something that was contemplated in the past. I took this and, and did some further tuning up to it here. And this is for virtual attendance at meetings, okay? 
Now, you all may be aware that back early in the pandemic, there was a, an executive order issued by the governor that allowed government boards to meet fully virtually through Zoom and other electronic means. That executive order has expired, okay? And as a result, fully virtual government meetings are generally not an option of a board that is going to be looking at or taking uh, votes on items. Now, we're gonna talk about some other types of sessions that may go on, that, that can go on by Zoom, and we look through the work plan, but we're talking about you all getting together and making decisions or talking about decisions and so on. That can't go on in a fully virtual circumstance. So we revert back to the rules as they were prior to that executive order. And the rules basically are these, that you can, if you all choose to allow it, can have virtual attendance at meetings if you have a quorum of the body physically present in the room, all right, in step one. And then two, members be permitted to attend virtually or electronically under extraordinary circumstances. This is from guidance we have from the Attorney General's office. What extraordinary circumstances are are left to the discretion of the body that's making, that um, is involved, okay? And they can do that either by putting it in their rules or making individual determinations at the beginning of each meeting, okay? The way they set it up uh, for the CRC before is they had some that they said were automatically, these are extraordinary circumstances and we're gonna allow it. Uh, and then other extraordinary circumstances could be determined by the board of the vote members physically present in the room if necessary at those times. What we have listed here and what I, uh, one of them I added. Previously we had had illness and unavoidable business related absence. I added pandemic or public health concerns. We did not think of such things back in 2015, 16. We simply didn't. Um, this is at your complete discretion as to how you want to deal with this. Um, I can tell you that it's my understanding from county staff that with regard to a number of your meetings, um, things are going to be set up such that your staff, particularly um, Mr. Spitzer and I, may be joining you for one or more of those meetings electronically via Zoom, okay? So the facilities to do it will exist. It will mean you'll still have to have a, a quorum physically present in the room, okay? So that is what all of that subsection E means. And any, I'd be glad any to answer questions. Any additional questions for Mr. Vos? So you'll be dr uh, drafting the final proposed rules and then we'll be voting on that at the next meeting? What I would recommend is um, you can uh, take a vote to approve minutes with direction on changes I'll prepare the final version that's the result of that vote, and then you all can review it at your next meeting and see if you have any tweaks to the language I created. All right, so Just so that the rules will go into effect and you know any tweaks or cleanup, we can do at that time. Okay, so you'd like us to do a motion with direction now? That's, that would be my recommendation. Okay, so do we have a motion uh, related to the proposed draft rules? Motion to accept the draft rules as written. Okay. Is there a second? Yes, Mr. Boss. I, I, I do want to, there is a correction. I don't know how it snuck in there, but you're, you're dead right about should be six instead okay. of, uh, should be six instead of seven. Okay. Any other, is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Any public comment? I, I do have a discussion. So yes, we, we, sure. we did say the adjustments of, um, the public comment that would need to be adjusted um, both at the top of the meeting and for the agenda items. And then we also need to make the adjustment of the six members mm -hmm. as opposed to seven. Yeah, so that's, that's a clarification for the purposes of the motion. First of all, I don't know who made the motion. Oh. Mr. Weinkrantz. Yeah, it's very difficult for her to know who made, made the motion. Motion uh, to accept Mark Weinkrantz. And the second was Mr. Schultz. And my, my recommendation to help staff on that, I know it's cumbersome, but it, it's when everybody wears masks, it, it's good to do exactly as you just did. Make the motion, then state your name, just so that it goes and, onto the and record. I'll try easily. to do that as well. Yeah. 
All right, so. Uh-oh, Esther Eugene, um, did you hear the, um, clear, the, the clerical? Um, all right, awesome. So with the adjustments to the motion, for public comment to be at the top of the meeting and then public comment for each agenda item. And then the additional adjustment under um, section C, there should be six members instead of seven. Mr. Weinkrantz, you accept And that? I'll adjust, uh, I'll amend my uh, motion to uh, include those amendments. Excellent, okay. I'd, I'd like to add uh, something to the discussion. Um, I think it's important that we provide a facility for the public to comment without being physically present. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's... Yeah, absolutely. And okay. I didn't know if we were going to talk about that more when we got into initial approach and work plan, because if you look at the initial approach and work plan document, which is part of the KSA, it's the last page of the Mr. Spitzer document, they reference Zoom meetings for October 6th, October 27th, and, I, and November 3rd. And so my, you know, my thought is that we would meet in person with a quorum in this room, but that members of the public uh, and others, uh, board members who couldn't be here and uh, consultants who couldn't be there would be able to attend via Zoom, very similar to how the Pinellas County Commission operates. I would imagine that that would be uh, workable. Is that, is that okay with everyone? Is that kind of the expectation? He, net heads nodding from staff and board members. Okay. Very good. Is that okay? And, yeah. And then the second thing, the second comment was for the ability for members of this um, redistricting commission, if we're unable to attend in person, to also be able to attend as you two can by Zoom or electronically. And, and that's as long that's, as there's a. Quorum. That's what that subsection E okay. provides. Thank you. That's all. I, I would think we would be pretty generous. With that, so long as we have a quorum, um, I think we'd be pretty generous with uh, with the remote attendance. If we don't have a quorum, we can't we can't take action. So uh, that would be the only concern with that. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Vose? All right. We'll move on to agenda item number five. Uh, I suggest you go ahead and. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no Let's take a vote. Yes. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Agenda item number five, uh, Mr. Spitzer, regarding presentation on redistricting process and criteria. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that was a very great presentation. No, wait. Uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, general criteria and process. I'm going to talk a little bit about the census that was recently uh, released, the data, talk about a case study, and then I'll, I'll get back in front of my laptop and we'll go through some of the software that uh, we're using. Let me, let me just begin by saying that uh, my experience with redistricting projects is that they're, they're pretty straightforward. They're plain vanilla. We look at the numbers. We look at the criteria. Um, and uh, we, we solicit public input for the process. But I, 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 I sense we're starting this now, another cycle around the state, and there's this angst that, uh, you know, it's a knockdown, drag out uh, uh, battle over over the different issues and that's not been my experience and 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 we uh you know follow these criteria pretty much by the book in in our process and uh so i just just wanted to get that out out front uh it need not be uh controversial as it may be in, in other places so so with that let me get into a, a few general guidelines here. Uh, redistricting is the process by which the legislative body, in this case is the county commission, you're an advisory body to them. Uh, Florida statute says it's the legislative body that at the end of the day uh, redistricts uh, its own district boundaries. But it's the process by which we equalize the differences in population by making adjustments to 
the district boundaries. It's not reapportionment. Reapportionment is the process by which, based on census data, we allocate new uh, seats, congressional seats, to a state. Florida, I believe the number is we're going to uh, gain one more seat uh, this, this cycle based on our population. Why do we do this? Well, it's required by the Florida Constitution in Chapter 124 for county governments. Um, there's additional direction to redistrict in the Pinellas County Charter uh, that was referenced recently. But importantly, it furthers the principle of one person one vote. That's why we're doing this, so that each person has an opportunity to exercise uh, their right to vote to the same extent as someone living in a different district within Pinellas County. There are common guidelines for redistricting. The most important one, the dominant criterion, is that the district should be nearly equal in population as equal in population as is possible. We don't dilute minority voting strength, and we're going to talk about these in greater detail. We follow census blocks. And then the rest of these criteria, in my mind, uh, is that they're sort of common sense criteria. Uh, they make it easier for the public and the voters to understand where the different districts are. Uh, but we follow significant boundaries, whether they're man-made or natural boundaries. Districts have to be contiguous. They should be relatively compact. We try to preserve communities of interest, whether they be neighborhoods or cities, and we use common sense. All of these criteria are considered together, and they're balanced against each other. Uh, there's not one districting plan in the state of Florida that attains all of the criteria perfectly. It's impossible to do, but it's a balancing act that you will go through and uh, your recommendations to the county commission will, will follow. So in terms of population, this is right out of the, the Florida Constitution. After each decennial census, the county commission divides the county into districts of a contiguous territory as nearly equal in population as practical. Florida statutes, similar uh, language, uh, nearly equal in population as is possible. Uh, changes to the boundaries can only be made in odd numbered years. Can't be made in e even numbered years. And so the county commission has between now and the end of 2021 to uh, do final adoption on a new redistricting plan if, if necessary. But the charter also has some language in it. Uh, the, the districts shall be contiguous and as nearly equal in population as is practicable. So what does that mean? Uh, we try to get the deviation from the, the mean, the ideal uh, population uh, as close to zero as is possible. Uh, that's sometimes really difficult to attain because this is balanced to some extent with other criteria. But generally speaking, if you have districts that are less than three percentage points over or under the ideal, the average, that's good. That's a good measurement to attain, to strive for. Uh, Population does not mean registered voters. It's people. It's not registered voters within Pinellas County government. And where there's instances where two districts have a, a deviation or a difference of more than 10 percentage points, that's a problem that raises a red flag with the courts. And here's an example. This, I think, was uh, Jefferson County a few years ago. And here, the largest district was about five and a half percent over. The smallest district was about seven and a half under. That's over 12 points. That's a red flag. And so there, in that case, what was done was to adjust those district boundaries so that we got closer to zero, 
without having a deviation between the largest and the smallest of more than 10 percentage points. There might be exceptions to uh, the 10-point rule. You should try to avoid getting more than 10 percent over, but there might be exceptions to create a minority influence or minority majority district, or if we know that there's a specific area of Pinellas County that's rapidly growing and it's going to continue to grow over the next 10 years, you might want to underpopulate that a little bit. And I might also say that the 10-point rule, something less than 10 points just by itself uh, does not mean that it's an acceptable plan. There might be instances where even nine points is is not acceptable. Secondly, we don't dilute minority voting strength. Uh, the two most commonly uh, uh, known ways that that happens is uh, packing and cracking. Packing is locating most of the minority population into one district so as to dilute the influence in other districts. Cracking is splitting the minority population into two or more districts so as to dilute influence in all districts. Here's an example of this. Here in this situation, uh, we have a, a minority population of 22, 23 percent, but it's pretty evenly distributed between two districts. There's one minority majority and one strong minority influence district. Packing adjusts the lines so that most of that population is moved into one district, or cracking adjusts the lines so that that population is split amongst four districts. So we want to avoid those uh, types of plans. We use census blocks. Um, it's readily available. Uh, it's presumed to be correct, uh, but I can tell you that we, we look for anomalies uh, here. Um, but it's the, the smallest unit of sort of building blocks that the census data comes down in. Uh, some places will consider voting age population in addition to total population. Uh, and so when maps are prepared, you can express the population of a particular district in two different ways. I will tell you that we've already looked at this, and uh, in all of the districts in Pinellas County, voting age, 18 years and older, is right around 84 percent. There's no wide variation in age of the districts. Uh, sometimes you might see places where voting age population is 90 percent in one district, but maybe 70 percent in another. For whatever reason, that's not the case in uh, Pinellas County. This information can be altered or supplemented with other sources of data. Probably wouldn't consider that in the year right after the, the a decennial census. But when you do that, uh, you need to document uh, valid reasons why you're doing that and how you did it. Uh, we've been involved in a few different places over the years where we've used supplemental data, and you need to be careful about uh, documenting uh, how you went about this. We follow significant boundaries, uh, could be existing district boundaries, could be major arterial roads, uh, water bodies, uh, things like that. It's easier to understand for the voters. It's less disruptive to voting precincts. Um, major uh, man-made boundaries and certainly natural boundaries are usually coterminous with the boundaries of census blocks, so it makes sense to do it that way. Other criteria, um, districts have to be contiguous. Uh, you can attain that by crossing a water body. You attempt to keep communities of interest together, in Pinellas County's case, cities, neighborhoods. Uh, there's a specific direction in the charter about cities and the unincorporated area. And you try to avoid districts with uh, bizarre 
shapes. We've all heard about the gerrymandering uh, example. This was a, a plan uh, created by uh, Governor Jerry uh, in Massachusetts uh, many years ago, and, and someone said, well, that looks like a salamander, and someone else said, no, it's really a gerrymander. So that's how that term came about. But doing that uh, is, should be avoided. Here's a more uh, recent example. This was 20 years ago or so, but this is a congressional district in uh, North Carolina, and it looks like this. It follows, I believe, uh, an interstate uh, road, uh, and this case uh, was, this plan was uh, rejected by the uh, Supreme Court, uh, which said that race can't be the sole or the predominant factor in redistricting. So, there are other criteria in the Pinellas County uh, Charter. Some are similar to uh, standard criteria. Some uh, are patterned after the so-called Fair Districts Amendments of a few years ago. First, uh, a district cannot be drawn with the intent to favor or disfavor a political party or an incumbent. Districts cannot be drawn with the intent or the result of denying or, or bridging the equal opportunity of racial and language minorities. Districts must be uh, contiguous. They must have equal population. And where feasible, uh, we try to follow municipal boundaries, not splitting municipalities, and we try to keep the unincorporated areas of the county together. So these are the, the common criteria in addition to the, what those found in the Pinellas Charter. And I think, again, we use population, we avoid diluting minority voting strength, we use census blocks, and then we use common sense uh, when we're drawing these things together. And again, there's not one plan in the state that attains all of these criteria uh, perfectly. It's just impossible to do so we do the best that we can. Here's an example of common sense. This was a, <clears throat> a districting plan uh, for a school board in Leon County uh, I don't, maybe 10 years ago or so. In Leon County, the county commission has five single member districts and two uh, commissioners who are elected at large. The school board has five single member districts. The supervisor of elections wanted the, the district's boundaries to be coterminous, and there's some good public policy reasons for, for doing that. It's, it's simple, it's uh, probably easier for the, for the supervisor to manage the election, easier for voters to understand. But the way that this was attempting to be done was to move the school board districts to be coterminous with the county commission districts uh, without any further uh, changes to the county commission districts. And so in plan five, which you see at the top there, the deviations over on the right between the smallest and the largest uh, district was great one point, less than one and a half points deviation. But if you look in the middle column, you'll see that uh, for most of the sitting school board members, there was, you know, widely new electorate in, placed into their districts. In fact, in two, over half of the uh, residents in those areas were brand new, had never voted for those persons before. Um, now, down in the bottom table, which is a plan I think is what they adopted, the, the deviations between the smallest and the largest were, were larger, but it was less of an impact on the electorate within the, the sitting members' districts. Things like that are um, great to try to pursue, but sometimes it, it needs to be done uh, in a more cooperative manner where both the county commission and the school board have a, have a say in uh, how the plans are drawn. 
So the census. Uh, we take a census in this country every uh, 10 years. Uh, it, it starts, you know, well more than a year before Census Day. Census Day is April 1st of 2020, and the data is presumed to be correct, but you should always check for anomalies. Uh, first question, how many people live at this residence? Uh, zero. You don't live here? Oh, including me? Three. <laughs> right? So you got to be careful with, with some of these, the, the data, especially when it comes out just like this one did just a, a few weeks ago. Um, but this was the original plan for uh, the, the 2020 census. A um, couple of key things here. Uh, the, uh, at the end of the year, the end of 2020, the census was supposed to deliver reapportionment counts to Congress. And then at the end of March of this year, the data was supposed to be delivered to states to be used in the state and local government redistricting process. That's not how it worked. Uh, primarily because of the pandemic, uh, we suspended field operations. Uh, the reapportionment counts were four months late to Congress and for uh, several months, and that's reflected in our, the draft work plan here in, the, in your packet, uh, we were not expecting the final data to be received until the end of September. And so remember that the county has to get this done by the end of the year with holidays. That really means by the beginning of December. So it really was a, a very narrow window uh, to get this done had the end of September been the, the target. It was released August 12th uh, of this year in the, the so-called legacy format. It's a little bit like uh, buying a desk at Ikea. You take the box home, you've got to put it together. So it, it required some uh, uh, tweaking to make sure that the data was uh, correct and uh, in a usable uh, format. I am told that the census still is going to release uh, uh, another data set at the end of September. It will be the same data, but it will be coming down in a format that will be a little bit more user friendly for lay people to use and manipulate themselves. Let me just give you one example. And I know that this is Quincy, which is infinitely smaller than than Pinellas County, uh, but uh, I, I think you'll, you can see uh, some of the things that in an extreme case might uh, need to be considered in the process. <clears throat> uh, Quincy was ordered by the court to go to uh, a system of five single member districts as opposed to an at-large uh, districting scheme 45 years ago, which they did. They haven't redistricted since that time until last year. And we remember we talked about the, the acceptable deviations of not greater than 10 percentage points between the largest and the smallest district. Well, in Quincy, it was 110 percentage points. It was huge. And so that the city um, have been annexing significantly south uh, past I-10 and adding people uh, to uh, its uh, boundaries. Um, and there were, so therefore, District 3, the light blue color, uh, needed to lose a significant uh, number of people. Uh, District 4 in the northern end of the city needed to gain uh, some, and so it, it sort of moved itself around in a counterclockwise uh, manner. Uh, but at uh, the end of the day, they adopted a plan with a deviation between the largest and the smallest of five or six uh, percentage points total. Uh, there are uh, four uh, 
minority majority uh, districts, plus uh, one of which is a Hispanic uh, influence uh, a district in that city. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. Questions for Mr. Spitzer? Okay. Mr. Spitzer, do you want to move into item six, discussion of existing district data? I do. Now, I need to go back to the, uh, my laptop for a second. And I believe we have a printout in the KSA memo with the spreadsheet. Excuse me. So in your packet, uh, there were two uh, maps that were provided, uh, and we call these uh, uh, existing district uh, maps. What the maps are, are um, the current district boundaries, uh, but with 2020 uh, data uh, embedded in it. And this is sort of the first step in the redistricting uh, process. And, and when you do that, then you sort of know um, where you're starting from and, and how much of a challenge a particular uh, pro uh, process or project may be moving forward. Is it going to be like Quincy was, or is it something uh, less significant in terms of uh, population differences between the, the different districts. Uh, there are two maps. You have uh, one for uh, single member districts. These are, there are four single member districts in uh, Pinellas County. Uh, single member districts is where only the voters of that particular district uh, have the ability to vote for a particular candidate. There are three at large uh, districts where uh, uh, candidates must live in a particular residence area, but um, all of the voters throughout the county uh, have the opportunity to vote for those uh, persons. Uh, some of the logic, the underlying logic of a, of a three and four plan like that is that it has some of the features of a single member district plan uh, and the underlying public policy there is that um, uh, people are more responsive to the needs of, uh, to their demands of the, the voters who elected people from single member districts. Uh, it does allow Pinellas County to create a minority influence uh, district. Um, at large uh, districts, uh, many of the different services that county governments provide uh, must be provided on a countywide basis. It's important to have people who reflect a countywide view on the governing body. So this has combinations of both, and each elector uh, still votes for a majority of the county commission. They have the opportunity to vote for three at large plus uh, their own uh, single member district uh, representative. So uh, if you look at the, the top of either uh, uh, map, um, you will see the uh, ideal population for each uh, district, and now I'm looking at a single member district map, the actual population uh, based on 2020 data, uh, the numerical deviation, percent deviation, then the population and percent of uh, white, black, and other races, and then uh, Hispanic uh, uh, ethnicity. Um, the data that comes down from the census uh, shows uh, persons in uh, white, uh, black, or other categories of race. There's six different categories that you can identify on your census form in terms of your race. Uh, and so the other that you see here is are people who 
have identified themselves as something other than a single race, white or black person. Um, but there also is the opportunity to uh, not only identify yourself as uh, a single race uh, Pacific Islander, uh, Native American Indian, uh, but some combinations of race. And so people are able to check not just one uh, race, but two, three, four, or five, or six. And so um, the, the grouping of other here is, is everyone who has not identified themselves as a single race. The census started this practice uh, uh, 10 years ago, and so um, that's what other is. If you add up other black and white, you'll get the total population of the county. Uh, Hispanic is not a race, but a, a, an ethnicity. Uh, people can identify themselves as white, Hispanic, black, Hispanic, some other uh, racial combination with Hispanic uh, ethnicity. So uh, as you, we just talked about uh, common criteria, and we look at the uh, percent deviation from the ideal population, and actually this, this current map is quite good, right? I mean, the deviations for single member districts, uh, the, the smallest district is 1.9% under the mean, the largest district is 1.4% over. So, uh, and there are some, some housekeeping changes that need to be made to these boundaries, which I can talk to you about in a second. Um, but beyond that, this is remarkably uh, a good. W would this be an appropriate time to ask questions? Certainly. Thank you. Um, so what I'm wondering is, uh, was KSA involved in the creation of these existing districts 10 years ago? Uh, no, but uh, we were involved uh, 20 years ago. We were not involved with the district 10 years ago. And so these boundaries were not created, they, these were created 10 years ago, not by you 20 years ago? Well, these boundaries were created by, or a, a variation of these boundaries were created by us uh, 20 years ago. We were not involved, I don't, I think they might have been tweaked a little bit. 10 years ago, I wasn't involved with that, but okay. yeah. Okay, um, and secondly, it would be very helpful if we knew what the change in racial composition was from 2010 to 2020. So we can see the deviation of the total population and it's true, these polygons are pretty, you know, pretty similar yeah. in actual population, but what we don't know, which would be helpful would be to know how many blacks moved out of or into, how many whites moved out of or into, how many Hispanics um, are, are represented or not represented. That change would be helpful, I think, right. to see. Right, um, I, I have wondered about that uh, myself um, because my, my recollection is just my recollection of when, when District 7 was created, my, my my memory of that was that the that the African American population of that district, as in terms of a percentage, was was much higher than 23 percent. Um, and so, why did that change? I'm I'm not sure about that. But but I'm I'm happy to try to find that information for you. Yeah, I, it would be super helpful if if we could see what the percentages were by race in 2010, and then the percentages now in 2020 with the current census data. We'll get that. Excellent Thank you. Thing. Thank you. All right. Um, and so in a similar vein for the at-large uh, districts, uh, obviously a larger ideal population, um, but again, the, uh, the percent deviations are uh, a little bit greater, but but still, you know, less than three percentage points difference between the largest and the smallest uh, district. Now, um, if if I might, uh, 
moving back to the single member district area, uh, there are a couple of areas that we highlighted where um, we just want to bring this to your attention. The census block boundaries uh, don't always stay the same. And um, there are times when these boundaries uh, change uh, during a particular decennial uh, census. Um, in terms of calculating population, that is typically not uh, significant if the change in the block was well within the district boundary. However, if it's on the edge between two different districts, like this area is here, well, then it's 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 something to look at. It uh, you know you you want to know well how much of a change is it? Um, what's the population difference? You know, and and so here we wanted to just bring this to your attention. This block. The, the, the red color is the current district boundaries. The, the, the green highlight around this particular block is the new district boundary. And so you can see where um, this has changed some. And let's give you, this is, I believe, in the countryside uh, area here. And so, This block has uh, 461 people in it. 442 identified themselves as being of one race. Um, zero uh, uh, African American. There are 39 uh, people who are of Hispanic ethnicity. Uh, someone asked a question about age earlier. Here's a 387 over 18. And then there's 33 other. So. Um, a very small area here. Uh, there are some, as you can see, homes here. But what we did for the purposes of just this initial draft was to uh, keep all of this population in District 5. Now, before this process was to end, if, if you all agreed with this, you would vote on this boundary and, and then we the lines would now follow uh, the outer edges of uh, block uh, don't see the block number here but each each it's a here we go it's a block uh, 3022 within track 026811 so mr spitzer may i may i just clarify so the yellow line is the current boundary between district 5 and district 4 and then the red that's intruding into District 5 would be a revised boundary based on the data, or is, am I uh, understanding that? Or? Right, it, it's sort of the opposite. Okay. The, uh, the red is the current uh, boundary of District 4. I see. Uh, the blue is the current boundary of District uh, 5. Uh, the, the green line is the uh, the new block boundary for that particular area. And so that had to go someplace. It was logical that it'd be assigned to District 5, uh, and that's what was done. So District 5 would move a little bit north? On that well, if, if you moment. followed this, this boundary, yes, District 5 would, would go a little bit north. For the purposes only of this spreadsheet to see where we are in the process, this population was assigned to District 5. I, I uh, and, and the great majority of this population, obviously, is within District 5 anyway. It's just a question of uh, the, these homes along right here. Okay. So. Mr. Spitzer, is the green block below all this within District 5? Is that proposing that that would change to a different district? No, this okay. this is still, this is also within District 5 as well. And this is well within the district boundary, right? There's one other one I want to show you here, moving on. This is between uh, District 5 and District 6. 
And here, you know, this, this boundary line here has been uh, disrupted by this uh, block here. And this block has uh, 245 people in it. Now, there are just a few homes here that are in District uh, 5. Uh, so this block population, for the purposes only of just this preliminary map, was assigned to uh, District 6. So there's, you know, there's things like this. But I think, you know, in general, what this, this shows is that um, there's not significant imbalances uh, now with, with the population of, of the, the different districts within Pinellas County. Um, and so, you know, I think some, some sort of policy questions for you is, are there other things that, that we want to perhaps look at? Um, I think that, for example, there's a policy criteria in your charter that says try to avoid splitting cities and try to avoid splitting the unincorporated area. Uh, there are, I believe, 24 cities in Pinellas County. It's very densely populated, it's very difficult to not split any city. But, and I think that the, the old plan uh, map uh, did a pretty good job of not splitting uh, cities, but you know, that certainly could be revisited again and, and to see if that's something that uh, needs to be tweaked in some uh, manner uh, like that. Uh, or, uh, there are other uh, areas here too to consider. Here is the city of Clearwater. Here is Clearwater Beach. Clearwater Beach is part of the city of Clearwater. Um, you know, one policy objective perhaps could be, well, shouldn't we put the city of Clearwater Beach into the rest of District 5, especially since it's connected, you know, via a bridge to the, to the rest of the city. Um, there's, I think, uh, 5,400 people that live there. Um, if you moved those folks over to District 5, uh, you probably would need to lose some population of District 5. Well, we do have this shape here in uh, District 5 that you know, it sort of juts a little bit north, you know, one option, just as an example, would be if you wanted to move Clearwater Beach into District 5, you know, how much of this uh, sort of little peninsula here could you move into uh, District 4 with roughly equal population, right? So there's things like that that could be considered as well. Um, so uh, we those are sort of the, Mr. Chairman, some of the kind of policy questions that, that the, the board needs to uh, uh, begin giving us a, a direction on. Um, but I, I, I am aware of your request for the, the change in racial composition. I, I, I've thought about that myself. I, I don't have a good answer for that yet. Okay, um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Spitzer. Um, so what it looks like here is there's really only, only six census blocks that have changed their boundaries. Well, <clears throat> we don't know how many that, have changed. That are, that are on, that are, that intersect. That's right, yeah. Uh, both, both lines. Yeah, and there, lines there, there's also some continuous. in the at-large boundaries, district boundaries as well. But yes, there, there's not many. There's, there's, I don't know how many census blocks are on Pinellas County. I would guess there could be uh, 30 or 40,000. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, a lot. There's a lot. I think there's more than 50,000. Okay. And but, but yes, on the, along the district boundaries, there's, there's a, a minimal number of blocks that have changed their shape. Would you also be able to provide the shape files that you're working with so that we have the same data that you are using for, for your calculations? 
I can give you the shape file, sure. Um, if not if to to use them, you know, in a way that makes sense. Uh, it uh, you need to have software that goes goes with it too. But um, yes, I do. Right, but that would be a, a problem. But sure, sure, sure can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Spitzer, were you, did you have any other items on number six uh, before I ask for additional questions on your presentation? Or um, uh, no, sir. I, just just to say that um, the data came out on the the twelfth. Um, it about. We spent maybe three days <laughs> working on it, uh, and uh, uh, so this map, uh, you know, there, there may be some other little housekeeping kinds of changes that might be necessary to this, this map, but um, uh, typically what the, the process is, uh, is, is that we would, in addition to this map, we would prepare you know, other sort of alternative maps that you could consider um, based on the, the criteria that we discussed uh, earlier this evening. Um, or if there's some, you know, direction, something that you're really interested in, in terms of seeing changes to district shapes, uh, district boundaries, uh, you know, we could sort of run on those, those, those concepts and, and come back to you with them. Yes, Mr. Weinkrantz. A quick question, uh, Mr. Spitzer. Thank you very much for setting the tone at the beginning. Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel here, and I also appreciate that you pronounce uh, Pinellas County correctly. But uh, <laughs> there were some problems with the census itself. Do we anticipate that because it's time compressed and maybe not all the information was presented that we may have to rely more on a little bit more of that common sense uh, input to coming up with the fair boundaries or are you very comfortable with the census data that we've received? Thank you. Well, um, I, I think that the, the, I, you know, I'm not, I can't comment on the, the the, the viability of the census data. I, I know that there have been some challenges in various courts. Um, I, I think that they will be uh, disposed of, uh, you know, well before our project is, is done with. But I, I can say this, that uh, some uh, uh, folks at the, the uh, University of Florida that, that do in between the census, they do enormous demographic work for the state of Florida. They're under contract with uh, uh, the, the Florida legislature. They do all of the projections for, uh, you know, school funding, tax revenues, population changes, things like that. Um, they, uh, their opinion, I think, is that th this data is 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 good. Uh, it's perhaps not as good as it might have been in previous uh, decades, but it's, uh, it's uh, as good uh, or, or better than perhaps what the public perception of the data might be. Uh, you know, there, there was a lot of controversy uh, a year, year and a half ago c concerning the census process itself, but uh, I think that they, are, are, they think that the data is pretty good now. Thank you for answering that question. I appreciate it. Other questions at this time for Mr. Spitzer on the current data? Uh, one question I had, just to clarify, you, you mentioned coterminous. Um, I think it was in relation to Leon County with the school board. My understanding is that our districts are coterminous in Pinellas County with the school board districts. Is that correct? Does anybody know that? I believe they are. I don't know. I believe that our school board districts match our county commission districts district by district. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to take, not that that means we can't change them, but obviously that was deliberate. At some point, the school board and the county commission got together, whether it was 20 years ago or, or whatnot, and said we should make the districts the same. 
Um, I don't know if the school board is going through a redistricting process. I don't know how that works. Um, I'd like a little additional information about that at our next meeting. Um, I think there tangentially is some value to a voter knowing that they're in district one for the county commission and they're in district one for the school board and it's the same thing. So if we are gonna change that, uh, I just wanna have that in the back of our minds that that may impact, I, I don't wanna confuse voters of course, so that may be something to think about. So I'd, I'd like a little more information about that at the next meeting, please. Yes, sir. I just have one comment. So just as a recap, Mr. Spixer, at the next meeting, we will be able to see the 2010 data along with the, 2000, the 2010 data along with the 2020 data. Is that what your request was, Karen? The 2010 data, right? Yes, I'm, I'm looking for changes in population um, in terms of the black population, the white population, and the Hispanic population between, by district, between 2010 and 2020. Okay. And, and then the additional piece that there may be some additional, um, because of the short period that you had to look at it, we can expect there's going to be some additional housekeeping to even what we see right now. There, 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 there might be. There, there, you know, um, the ones that we've talked about this evening are, are ones that were necessary because of changes to the shape of different blocks, but there, there might be other ones. You know, uh, here's, here's one here. Um, You know, in the in the the districting process, you, we like straight lines, you know, or or to follow a you know significant roadways here. Um, so I, I'm not sure why this is here. Nobody lives there, uh, but and there's another one. Uh, nobody lives there, but you know for. I would consider this almost another housekeeping change, uh, but it's not because of the, a change in a, in a block shape. It's just the way this 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 is. I, I'm not sure why it is like that, but um, th things like that. Uh, it looks like it is a, a commercial or a school or uh, something. Is that McMullen Booth Road? Pardon me? I'm trying to figure out where that is. Oh. Um, is that McMullen Booth on the, is it right there? And then Drew, and is that Drew Street? That could be Baycare, it could be Calvary Baptist Church. I'm just, anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So there might be things like that, but all of those would, would come back to you to look at before any sort of recommendation. And then there's other, you know, there's, we talked about the, the Clearwater Beach example. That's clearly not a housekeeping thing, but it's sort of a logical kind of thing to, to think about, especially if you, you paired that with um, moving this area of District 5, you know, farther south, because you bring in, you know, 5,000 people or so from Clearwater Beach, um, you could move an equivalent number of people from District 5 into back into District 4 because they, they, you're just moving things from 5 to 4 and, and vice versa. So there's things like that. Sure. Uh, Thank you, sir. We'll, we'll have a lot of interesting discussions with that. That's an interesting problem. Countryside is also part of Clearwater, but Countryside is now bifurcated. And if you were to put Clearwater Beach into District 5, I think you'd want to maintain Dunedin holistically in District 4. And of course, there's part of Dunedin that's um, uh, on the beach, not, not Clearwater Beach, but north of that. So uh, all, all good things for us to consider and uh, talk about in the coming month. Uh, we ready to move on to agenda item number seven to approve the work plan. Can I ask one more question? Yes, sir. Uh, just in terms of work product, Mr. Spitzer, um, when requests come in for different views of these things, uh, how work intensive is it to redraw lines and give us information or do we have the technology in this room while we're sitting here 
for you to drag and drop and move lines so we can see where the balance is? Yeah, um, the, the answer is uh, yes, but uh, it's, um, it, it can be done, but you know, it's, uh, it's a time consuming, I mean, not that it takes hours, but, but to, to, to make a, a change, uh, it could take 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So, you know, if we all want to make, you know, six people have different ideas and, and there goes a, you know, a couple hours there. So, um, and I, I don't like doing things on the fly here and, and, and saying this is perfect, you know. Uh, so, yeah, yes, but if we can try to avoid doing that, I, I prefer that if that's possible. Uh, you know, if, but, but if there's like, and plus, if there's general concepts that are um, significant in terms of moving lines around, you know, I definitely would rather do that in between now and the next meeting, as an example, and, and come back to you with, with uh, the, the data as to how that might look. Okay. I, yes, I have sir. one more question. Yes. Uh, Mr. Spitzer, would it be possible also to see this in relation to, to city boundaries? Yes. Boundaries. It, yes. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if some of these are drawn to respect city boundaries. Right. Let me see if I can. Uh, well, the, the, they, um, many of them are. Uh, let me see if I can. No, hold on. All right, so um, this is uh, Clearwater, all right? So does, it, does this boundary follow Clearwater perfectly? Obviously, it does not. Um, does it follow the Clearwater boundary somewhat? Yes, it does. Um, it doesn't pick up Clearwater Beach, but but it you know, you, you could. It expl it explains why you have that little uh, jog up there north. Yeah. Yeah, that, that could be it right there. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, and actually, you know, Clearwater includes that other part of District 4 to the to the left of that little peninsula. So that peninsula actually bifurcates countryside, the neighborhood of countryside. So part of countryside is in District 4 and part of countryside is in District 5. So other areas, um, Largo, Largo is a... Uh, Pretty much contained all in District Five. Uh, Bel Air Bluffs. You know, all of it's. It's. I would say it's. Let's look at St. Pete, where, as you can imagine, uh, so you see, it, it's St. Pete is of such a size, especially for single-member districts. You, it's impossible to not split. The city of St. Petersburg. Um, Pinellas Park. A little bit of an, you know, in, intrusions over the district boundary of seven, but, you know, uh, pretty good. But I, we can we can do some work and and come back with you with more detailed information about how many cities are actually split to what extent. I just like to say um, these boundaries are based on census data and the census data is a primary source that academia and the rest of the world uses um, to, to answer the questions for redistricting that, that are asked with respect to um, keeping different groups together. Um, so I think it's more difficult to try to represent 
cities other than just drawing the boundary with over top of your existing districts. So I don't want uh, KSA to have to spend so much time, you know, allocating population to cities based on the boundaries. I think it would be sufficient just to look at where the city boundary is as an overlay. Okay. Yeah, sure. The, 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 you know, I think that the, the charter says what it says. Um, I will tell you that it, in recent exercises that we've been involved with, there, there are, are sometimes uh, there's a policy direction that's taken where the, the idea is, well, splitting a city amongst by two or three districts in some ways is good because the, the residents of that city have, a, you know, greater access to more members of the county commission. Just observing that. But, but the Pinellas Charter says exactly what it says. And, but we can get a, just an overlay like that, sure. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments on item six? Okay. So the initial approach and work plan was the last page of the KSA memorandum. Um, we already discussed, um, I think, the meetings the, the meetings of this board, October 6th, 27th, and November 3rd, uh, would be available both in person and virtually for board members, members of the public, and staff. Uh, so I don't want anyone, it says Zoom, but I want to make sure that, that we're clear that those will be hybrid meetings. Is that everyone's understanding and is staff okay with that? and that we'll be able to facilitate public yes. comment uh, both in person and virtually at those meetings. Okay. Mr. Chairman, so yes, those, are the, those are the community meetings you're referring to? Uh, no, I'm referring to October 6th, okay. 27th, and November 3rd. Those are the actual meetings of our board. Right. And then, that's a great question, the community meetings, the intent for those, Mr. Spitzer, is that for you to facilitate those with members of the community and for us to attend and observe, or is, are those supposed to be formal sunshine meetings where we're there right. in a formal capacity? How, how are those meetings going to be discussed? Um, the intent originally of when this document was prepared uh, for those meetings was that they would be, there would be one community meeting uh, to discuss plans and garner input from the public in each of the four single member districts. Anybody could go to any meeting that they wanted to, but, and, and some would be in the evening, some would be in the morning, uh, but there'd be one meeting in each uh, district area. And typically how those work is that uh, they are uh, uh, in-person meetings that I facilitate, they're not meetings uh, where the, they're not a meeting of the, of the redistricting board where there has to be notice and sunshine and, and those sorts of things. Now, um, there's, I don't know how many people from the public are here tonight, uh, but not many. Um, and, and so, you know, perhaps there's an alternative that could be done where th these meetings are all online and, and we might get more people uh, uh, attending that way um, uh, to, to do it online. So it's just something for your uh, consideration. But, but these uh, are intended to be uh, mechanisms whereby alternative plans are presented and explained to the public and we get input back from the public. And, you know, I, I like plan 1.1 but move this line over there and move a different line over there and and uh, we come back to you and see if there's a consensus on moving ahead with plan 1.1 dot a um, and but eventually we uh, whittle the process down so that there's a, a I forget if the charter says a plan or plans that are delivered to the county commission for their consideration so so if the a question would be for the uh, October meetings, would that be just in-person uh, meetings uh, such as this, or would they be all, you know, online types of meetings? 
So you're talking about these are the community meetings for October 13th, 14th, 20th, and 21st? Yes, sir. You know, they, at which, you know, I, we, we need to talk with the council here too, but I, I you know, the, there is a possibility of accelerating that now that we have the data uh, now as opposed to getting it at the end of uh, this month. I, I would think ideally you would, if it's not possible to do a hybrid meeting where it's in person and available online that you would do you know, maybe two in person and two online or three in person mm -hmm. and one online. So people that want to attend online, no matter where they are, can attend online. And then if you have the three, you can spread it out, North County, Mid County, South County, or, or something along those lines. I, I trust you all to do a good job with that, but maybe depend, unless anyone feels really strongly about it tonight, maybe give us an update at our next meeting about what your intention is with that. Okay. Is that fair? Or Do we need to take a vote on the initial approach and work plan with that input? We do. We have to do um, the vote of approval on it. Okay. Do I have a motion on the initial approach and work plan with the feedback that has been provided? I so move with the motion with the small adjustment of Mr. Spritzer coming back with a um, plan in regards to the October 13th, 14th, 20th, and 21st. Thank you. Vice Chair Esther made the motion. Is there a second. second. Mr. Everett, any discussion? Any public comment? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, that carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, number eight is review invoices. We have one invoice um, from Mr. Spitzer's firm. I'm assuming that the county staff is recommending approval and it's within the uh, the purchase order procurement policy? Two. There's two. <laughs> there are two, and they're for the same amount? Yeah, August and July. Okay. Okay. You confirm that it's consistent with the purchase order? Is there a motion? Yeah, I make a motion that we approve both invoices. Okay, for Mr. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? That carries unanimously. Any other business? I know it's been a long meeting. Anyone from the public that didn't get a chance to comment at the beginning on items not on the agenda that would like to comment? Yes, sir. I saw you sitting here the whole time, so I wanted to give you your chance to comment. Please state your name and address, and uh, you'll have three minutes to comment, sir. My name is Joe Barkley. On the mic, okay. Yeah. Joe Barkley, uh, 2167 Lanai Avenue, Bel Air Bluffs, Florida. Uh, there has been considerable controversy with regard to the validity of the census because it was curtailed and it was. Uh, not fully uh, completed with regard to certain segments of the uh, country. I don't know what the impact is on that for this particular committee's work, but it is relevant in terms of undercounting and in terms of uh, allocation of assets. So I don't know how that will fit into your committee's agenda, but I just wanted to clarify if you could um, if that's a relevant factor for for this committee's operation thank you mr barkley and uh mr spitzer i'm not sure if we asked you for this before but i know mr weinkrantz brought it up so uh, i know you referenced uf and some experts on the reliability of the data but if you have any um data about the data or opinions about the data or analysis of the data that might be helpful as well all right We'll do that uh, for the next meeting. Thank you. Any other new business? All right. If not, we'll be adjourned. Thank you all so much. Safe travels home. Thank you.